I'd like to call this meeting to order. Do we have any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, I'll move on to public meetings. Welcoming, good morning. Today, there is one public meeting regarding a proposed development application in accordance with the Planning Act, followed by a second non-statutory public meeting regarding proposed amendments to the township's existing site alteration and fill bylaw 2011-23 as amended and a new proposed tree conservation bylaw. I'm pleased to advise that this is being broadcast live on the YouTube on the township's YouTube channel where a recording of this meeting will be available. Public notice for the statutory public meeting number 1-3244 and part 3260 Hampshire Hampshire Mills line. Notice of this meeting was sent by first class mail to all property owners within 120 meters, 400 feet of the subject properties. Signage was also posted on the subject property to provide information about the application. All of this was in conformance with the Planning Act process for a statutory public meeting. Public notice, the stat non statutory public meeting number two, site alteration bill, tree conservation. The proposed amendments to the township's existing site alteration and fill bylaw 2011-23 as amended and the new proposed tree conservation bylaw would apply throughout the township therefore notice of the non-statutory public meeting was given by placing an ad in two local online newspapers with sufficient general circulation in the area to which the proposed amendments would apply additional notice was also posted on the township's website and social media channels the purpose of both the statutory and non-statutory meetings is to inform and provide the public and the planning and development committee with an opportunity to ask questions or express views with respect to the proposals. The format of the statutory public meeting regarding 3244 and part of 3260 Hampshire Mills Line will be as follows. One, the applications agent will generally explain the purpose and effect of the application. Second, Township staff will provide further information and clarify any statements of the applicant or their agent. Next, the public will be permitted to ask questions and express views on the proposal. It is requested that those who have already submitted written comments that they are not to be repeated in full as they have already been circulated to the members. Once all the public co comments have been received, the public portion of the meeting will be closed and Lastly, members of the committee will be given the opportunity to ask questions for clarification on the proposal and provide comments. At the conclusion of the meeting for each application, the applicant, their agent, and if required, township staff will be given the opportunity to respond to the questions and comments received. No decision will be made today following the public meeting on the proposed zoning, zoning bylaw amendment application. Following this meeting, the information obtained included including from questions and comments submitted by members of the public and committee will assist the township and applicants team to determine next steps. Once the township is satisfied with the information provided by the applicants and their consultants, an additional public meeting may be scheduled or a report will return to this committee. The township is the approval authority for the proposed zoning bylaw amendments for which this committee may recommend the bylaws be considered by council or ask for additional information prior to Council's consideration. If in the future Township Council decides in favor of the applications by adopting recommendations from this committee, members of the public who have provided oral or written submissions but disagree with the decisions may be entitled to appeal the decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal under the Planning Act. Individuals attending the public's me public meetings by YouTube, Zoom, or telephone may receive or may email or call the township's planning department to submit contact information to receive notice of the decision of the application. Public meeting for 3244 and part of 3260 Hampshire Mills Line Zoning Bylaw Amendment application. The applicant's presentation. 
I now call on the applicant's agent for Morgan Planning and Developments to please present the information provided within line item on the agenda C131 of the agenda package and explain the purpose and effect of the application. Good morning, Chair and members of committee and council. Uh, also members of the public, I believe there's a number of, of uh, members there. So uh, thank you very much for allowing me to have a few minutes to speak this morning on this application. Uh, so for those who may not know who I am, my name is Victoria Lemieux. I'm a senior planner with Morgan Planning and Development. I'm here this morning on behalf of the subject property owner, uh, who I believe may also be there in attendance in person this morning. So. Chair, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna share my screen on my screen quickly for a short presentation. Okay, hopefully that's up on the screen now for everybody to see. Uh, and for the record, as well for the clerk, uh, our mailing address is 98 Tecumseh Street, Aurelia, Ontario, L3V6K8. So the application uh, in front of the committee this morning for discussion and for uh, members of the public for comments and questions uh, is located along the west side of Hampshire Mills Line, just north of the Stockdale Road intersection, as you can see here. The subject property has a total uh, lot frontage of approximately 75 meters along Hampshire Mills Line and a total lot area of approximately 2,600 square meters or 65 acres. The subject property is currently developed with a single detached dwelling. However, the property is primarily agricultural in nature, as you can see here. On the left side, we have the full extent of the subject property outlined in red with a zoomed in uh, image here on the right side showing that existing residential use. Uh, and of course, this is located more closer to the Hampshire Mills uh, frontage. So the purpose of the application that we're speaking about this morning is essentially twofold. So the first purpose of this application is related to a previously approved consent application being application B06-2023, which was provisionally approved by the Township's Committee of Adjustment back in November. Uh, so the purpose of the application is in line with uh, the, deci the decision that was made, which is to uh, rezone a small portion of lands that was added to the subject property from an adjacent property uh, from the rural residential zone back to the agricultural zone. The second purpose of this application is to allow for the property owner to uh, construct a two-story accessory uh, building for combined use, which the owner of the uh, residential building would use for number one as a detached garage on the ground floor level and for an accessory dwelling unit in the second level to be uh, inhabited by their in-laws. So uh, on the left side of your screen here, we have the concept plan showing the uh, location of the proposed accessory structure. The location of this structure was determined to be the most appropriate based on the existing partially disturbed area where it's located, as well as to ensure that the overall cluster of buildings on the property is maintained uh, in a smaller area, which is aligned with all applicable policies when it relates to agricultural uh, uh, properties. So specifically, uh, again, when speaking to the construction of this accessory structure, uh, a number of site-specific provisions would be required in order to allow for its construction. So the first being uh, the allowance of a ground floor area of 140 square meters for a private garage, Secondly, for a floor area of 140 square meters for that accessory dwelling unit on the second level. Third being the overall maximum gross floor area of the building itself being 280 square meters. Then also it would require a maximum height of 8.5 meters where five meters uh, is permitted again to allow for that second story to be constructed as well as an interior side yard setback of 4.5 meters where six meters would otherwise be required. So here we have some 2D elevations of that accessory uh, building for, for your consideration. So as you can see, the building has been designed uh, to complement the surrounding rural residential and agricultural nature of the area. And here we have um, more of a side 3D uh, rendering as well uh, for uh, the committee's consideration. 
So the subject property as a whole is primarily zoned agricultural, uh, as mentioned, with a small sliver, essentially this small uh, rectangle that hopefully my mouse is, is cursing over, um, is, is that small portion that would be rezoned from that rural residential zone back to agricultural, but otherwise the rest of the property is in the ag zone. And the subject property is also designated agricultural in the township's official plan. Uh, as part of this application process, and we submitted a detailed planning justification report that I believe was circulated to the committee uh, and posted for uh, public viewing, uh, conducted a very thorough review of all applicable planning policy, inclusive of both the provincial policy statement and the growth plan. Uh, it is our opinion that was outlined in that report that this application, uh, both portions of this application, uh, do not offend the applicable agricultural or housing policies of these provincial documents. Further, uh, it is our opinion that uh, both the County of Simcoe and the Township's official plan policies as well related to uh, agricultural uses and the intent of those designations uh, as well as overall housing policies are also uh, not offended through the proposed application and development. So in summary, uh, it is my professional opinion that the application conforms to all applicable planning policy as mentioned. The proposed uh, site-specific agricultural zone will maintain the permitted uses and performance standards of the parent AG zone. Uh, the proposed accessory structure and its proposed uses are supplementary to the primary agricultural use on the subject property. And it is uh, our opinion that this will not interfere in any of the surrounding agricultural uses on this property or adjacent properties. And overall, the building has been designed to complement the rural residential and agricultural nature of the surrounding area as viewed in the uh, building elevations. So I'm happy to take uh, any questions or comments from committee or members of the public, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lemieux. Does the Township's planner, Brad Oster, have anything further to add to the materials and information presented by the applicant? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Lemieux has covered the purpose and effect of the application as well as explained her policy analysis um, as it relates to the applicable planning policy documents, which staff do concur with. Um, as noted within the staff report, there were some shipping containers observed on the property, which may not be in compliance with the township zoning bylaw during the site inspection. Um, however, staff are comfortable with dealing with that uh, matter outside of this rezoning um, application, so we are comfortable to, to address that outside of this. Um, a review has also been undertaken by the building division for the servicing of the subject property, uh, and it has been confirmed that there is sufficient land to accommodate appropriate services on site to service both the existing dwelling as well as the proposed accessory dwelling unit above the attached garage, or sorry, the detached garage. Um, so that um, basically concludes everything I just wanted to, to highlight to the committee. If there's any questions, more than happy to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oster. Pu uh, public questions and comments. Any person present on Zoom or the telephone or in person who have either questions or comments on the application will be now invited to speak. Uh, please unmute yourself when recognized and turn your camera on if you wish or and turn on your camera if you wish. You will be required to give your full name and address for the minutes. Please note that your comments will be also be recorded and live streamed on the Township's YouTube channel and will remain online. The Township does not have the ability to edit live stream to or edit the live stream to remove any personal information provided in the course submitting in the course of submitting comments or questions. Is there anyone online that would like to participate in the public meeting for the Hampshire Mills matter? We will get to the tree cutting one in a bit. I'm not seeing any hands go up or anyone indicating online, Mr. Chair. Okay, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak uh, that are here in the room, Uh, 
we've had problems in the past with new developments, buildings, etc. Just wondering if there was a drainage plan conducted, being as it's next to agricultural land. Steve Lovering, 2653 Upper Big Sheep Road. Mr. Oster. Uh, thank you, uh, through the chair. Uh, the grading of the subject property would be assessed by the building department through the building permit process to ensure that there would be no negative impacts to any of the neighboring properties um, or as well the, the agricultural um, use of the lands. Thank you. Is there any further public comments? Uh, could the township's planner, Mr. O uh, Oster, please summarize any additional correspondence that has been submitted on this application and provide any further information? Thank you, Chair. Um, so in addition to the correspondence, which was detailed in the staff report, as well as included a, as an attachment to the agenda, the County of Simcoe has also provided comments um, in support of the application, provided the township staff are satisfied that the development and site alteration is in a location on the property that does not compromise any natural heritage features as identified by the Simcoe County Official Plan and the Provincial Policy Statement. Um, and staff are um, of the opinion and agree with the opinion of Morgan Planning that there would be no negative impacts um, and therefore the county uh, has no objection to the proposed application in principle based on um, the applicable policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does the applicant's agent wish to provide any further information on the application? Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I'm just here if the uh, uh, committee have any further questions for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do the members of the committee have any comments? Member Cox? Yeah, I uh, I think this is all right. I, I don't have a problem with this uh, application at all. Just to put forward my um, affirmative on it. Member Minnings. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I do have one question. I'm looking at the satellite drawing of the property, and then it appears that to this well, from the slide to the lower part of it, there are three existing homes uh, with driveways going out to the road. Also. I'm concerned, or my question is around the accessory building, the two-story building that's being proposed. Is that, does that conform with the existing properties? And I'm assuming again, they're residential. Do they have those kinds of two-story accessory buildings? Um, so it's just from a, a standpoint of what's already existing on that street in that residential strip, if you could speak to that. Sure, through you, Chair, uh, to the member, thank you for your question. Uh, so you are correct that, and actually I'll just reshare my screen so I can show uh, the members of the public what properties you're speaking of. Um, I'm assuming it's these three parcels that you were referring to? Yes, that's correct. Great, so uh, yes, and, and these parcels here um, were uh, previous rural residential severances uh, Way back. I don't know exactly when they were created, but I believe it was in the 70s or 80s that they were uh, created off the original parcel. And those properties are more of a rural residential natured property. Um, so they do have some accessory structures. Um, I, I do not recall from when I went to the property back in the fall if they had full two story accessory structures, but I believe um, some of them had one and one and a half stories. Uh, there is uh, some uh, vegetative buffering in between all of those properties. So when you're driving up and down, uh, there is a reasonable amount of, uh, uh, you know, structure separation, which definitely uh, helps in regards to any potential mitigation measures visually from adjacent properties. Uh, the subject property itself is obviously the largest parcel as you can see here and is more agricultural in nature. So um, we do still feel that the two story uh, structure uh, will not negatively impose on the adjacent parcel. And as you, it's harder to see here, but there is uh, some, some substantial uh, tree vegetation that exists on the adjacent uh, property. But again, uh, a number of uh, members of our office, as well as uh, staff also went up to the property and 
uh, we do still feel that the application is consistent. And the neighbors have, of course, been also informed of this process, and they have seen uh, the proposed development through the notice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lemieux. Any other further comments? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, do we have a, a draft motion? We do. So the motion reads that planning report number P24-12 dated March 20th, 2024 with respect to zoning bylaw amendment application file number Z2401 for the subject lands located at 3244 Hampshire Mills line be received. And further that draft zoning bylaw amendment be presented for council for consideration at the next available meeting subject to comments received prior to council's consideration of the zoning bylaw amendment, including additional submissions from council, the planning development committee, members of the public circulated agencies, and township departments. Okay, any comments uh, on the motion from the members? No? Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, member Park and Member Brennan. All in favor? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, I would declare that the public meeting on this application is not closed. I will move on to the non statutory public meeting, the site alteration bill and uh, tree conservation. The proposed amendments to the site alteration and fill bylaw 2011 23 as amended and the new proposed tree conservation bylaw apply throughout the township. These bylaws have been brought forward for public comment and further consideration at the direction of Township Council at their meeting of November the 1st, 2023. The format of the non-statutory meeting will be as follows. Township staff and the township's consultants will generally explain the purpose and effect of the proposed bylaws. Next, the public will be permitted to ask questions and express views on the proposals. It is requested that those who have already submitted written comments that they are not repeated in full as they have already been circulated to the members. Once all the public comments have been received, the public portion of the meeting will be closed and lastly, the members of the committee will be given the opportunity to ask questions for clarification on the proposal and provide comments. At the conclusion of the meeting for the bylaws, township staff and our consultants will be given the opportunity to respond to the questions and comments received. No decision will be made today at the non-statutory public meeting on the proposed bylaws. Site alteration and fill amendments presentation. The Director of Public Works, Mr. Burke, and the Township's Consultant, Mr. Rick Naughton from Azimuth, will start with the proposed amendments to the existing Site Alteration and Fill Bylaw 2011-23 as amended. Thank you through the Chair. So yeah, I'd like to kick off the uh, Site Alteration and Fill Bylaw update. Um, so you'll see there that the original con um, initiation of this bylaw was 2011 and it served us quite well for a number of years. Um, some minor amendments throughout the term 2012 and I believe uh, 2014 as well. And uh, and then so it was time for an update. There's been a significant change in regulation as it relates to excess soils uh, in the province and as well as uh, some additional features uh, to con to regulate site alteration. So what we did is we retained the consulting engineer Azmuth Environmental and I have with me today Brendan McNaughton uh, who will share some of the key features of the proposed amendments to this bylaw. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, you'll have to bear with me. I think I was going to share my screen if I can for the presentation. Yes, you're welcome to share your screen. Huh. I may be welcome, but it doesn't seem to let me. <laughs> is... <sighs> oh, 
Brennan, Thank I'll, you. Be your, I'll be your, your <laughs> let me know when you need a slide advanced. Awesome. Sorry about that, guys. I'm apparently technically incompetent. Um, so we were contacted by the township to review the existing bylaw from 2011 and propose some updates to the bylaw to bring it into line with some of the new regulations uh, that have been brought out into Ontario. Um, so we can go to slide two there. So essentially, Ontario Regulation 40619, which is the on-site and access soils management uh, regulation, is, uh, well, it was brought in 2019 and then postponed in 2020, 21, and 22, and then brought into effect on January 1st of 2023. It essentially is to, uh, in essence, control the removal, shipping, and placement of soils um, from developed areas which are considered to be excess. And the regulation introduces a selection of guidelines that essentially have responsibilities both on the origin sites, the haulers of the soils, and the temporary and final uh, receiving sites. Uh, the second purpose for our proposed updates was to address the site alterations. So uh, the original bylaw really focused mainly on the importation of fill for uh, um, site alterations, whereas the updates are to also help to regulate the changing of grades and, and designs within on a site itself. And the final piece was to kind of bring into a lot of the environmental impact assessment portions of site alterations. So looking at the environmentally protected areas around the site, uh, both on and off the site, and looking at the various features of uh, to protect the waterways and um, the wetland complexes that are either both evaluated or unevaluated. Um, we'll move to the next slide there. So. One of the first updates that we brought in was the uh, deleterious, soil, uh, deleterious soils, which is essentially changing from just waste soils or, or soils that are contaminated to soils that may have a negative effect on the property in general. Um, the Another update was the areas of natural scientific interest. So these are areas that are defined clearly um, by the government they identify areas as having earth and life science values that are related to the protection of scientific study or education. Uh, they're generally identified by the Ministry of Natural Resources, and, and so they have their own piece in this. Uh, we've introduced uh, hauler and hauling records. This is to keep in line with the regulation 406. Um, it's a requirement for both the shipping sites, the receiving sites, and the haulers to keep these records so that they can uh, identify where the soil came from and where the soil was taken to and identify what the chemical testing that was done on that soil prior to being brought to site um, had. Uh, we've defined the site alteration activities as opposed to simple fill activities. The placement records, again, this is another piece that relates to the regulation 406. So essentially this is under the regulation, you need to be able to say where a group of soils were placed once they were brought to your site. So if you've taken 10 truckloads of soil and spread them across your site, you need to be able to estimate, well, this section over here had these 10 trucks and this section over here had these 10 trucks. Um, it's, it's Again, it's a record keeping and it is keeping in line with the Ontario uh, on regulations. Um, Pond and ponding has been defined, and this relates to the site alteration activities. So this is simply to define what is a pond and what is ponding considered. So if you've changed or altered the site and ponds have developed, and how that can be defined. The qualified persons, uh, the definition has been added again for the Ontario Regulation 406. It's defined on both Ontario Regulation 406 and 153, which is essentially, uh, it's also defined in the Engineers Act and the Geoscientist Act, and it's basically who can sign off on the soil evaluations. Uh, we've updated the subject site. So in, in terms of the regulation, the subject site is uh, defined as the project area. So it may be 
one lot, it might be 20 lots. Um, there is legal definitions on who owns the lots and that kind of thing. And the final one would be for topsoil. And this is literally a definition under the soil classifications. It refers to soils that are, are very humic rich. Uh, they're usually the A and O um, horizons within a soil profile. Um, and this was just so that essentially one of the uh, design features that we were tasked with was ensuring that people could top dress their lawns, uh, create gardens, and, and have no effect with this bylaw on the ability for people to do that. Uh, moving on to the next slide there, we'll go sort of through the highlights of some of the changes. So the big one is a, a new section, which is the uh, introduction of a defined haul route agreement. So this is to uh, uh, define within the permitting process where the soil is coming from, how it's going to get there, and which uh, roads, whether it be municipal or provincial roads that are being used to de deliver the, the pieces. Um, there's the integration of the environmental impact studies for the surrounding lands. I, these are very standard terms that are for EISs, but they're kind of brought down to size for smaller um, applications. Again, as we've talked a fair bit about the adaptation, adaptation for the Ontario Regulation 406 documentation, um, this is for both the receiving sites protection and also allows for peer review of the documents by the township so that we can, or I'm saying we, but so that the township can determine if the soils being brought in do in fact meet the requirements and regulations that are in place. The, there's a couple of lines for the prevention of long-term storage sites. Under the Ontario Regulation 406, there are what are called long-term soil sites, which change the way that the soil can be kept on site. And it's my understanding that the township wants to prevent this because long-term storage sites can be kept up to five years, I believe it is, it might be six years. And this would all be then done without permits because it would be classified under a, a storage site rather than an actual solid alteration. Um, we've tried to address the, the definition for exemptions of homeowners top dressing their lawns, expanding and creating gardens. This way it, it will only affect the people who are drastically altering their site and not the people who are just simply um, you know, making their lawn a little better or putting in a vegetable garden. The original bylaw had a clause in it that prevented the bringing of soils from any areas outside of Simcoe County um, through discussions with the township. We've expanded that to allow from the surrounding townships. This allows for sort of a good practice around while still preventing soils from coming from further afield so that it, it Severn Township doesn't become kind of a dumping ground for other areas. The other piece that we've changed is we've added the inclusion of a water-based, feature-based water balance. What this is for is to make sure that the natural environment on, around, and surrounding the site isn't uh, affected in terms of the groundwater and surface water features. Um, if we move on to the next slide there. This is the the worst part, I guess, the questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. McNaughton. Moving on to uh, public questions and comments. Any persons present on Zoom or the telephone who have either questions or comments on the proposed amendments to the existing site alteration and fill bylaw 2011-23 as amended will now be invited to speak. Please turn on your camera and raise your hand if you have any comments or questions. You'll be required to give your full name and address for the minute. Please note that your comments will also be recorded and live streamed on the township's YouTube channel and will remain online. The township does not have the ability to edit the live stream to remove any personal information provided in the course submitting comments or questions. And if I can, Mr. Chair, before we get started with comments, just want to make sure this is clear. Um, at this point, we're not taking comments on the tree bylaw. This is purely about the fill bylaw. We will come back to the tree bylaw. It's next. So for anyone in attendance, for anyone online, we're trying to break up the conversation so we get some targeted comments. So um, 
does anyone online have questions on the fill bylaw? Uh, we have a registered list of those that want to speak on the tree bylaw, uh, but no one registered on the fill bylaw. Not seeing any hands go up or yep. yeah, I'll, we'll get well. I'll come to you, sir. Yep. I'll come to you, sir. Yeah. Okay. We try and give people a minute because not everyone's quick with technology. So. <laughs> Okay. okay. Uh, seeing none in on the online. Thank you, Ma Madam Clerk. Uh, if there are any members of the public present in the council chambers who would like to speak, please raise your hand. You'll be required to come up to the front table and to provide your name and address for the minutes. A couple, uh, so smaller properties, such as, oh, you want to turn it on? Okay. Okay. Oh, Jim Gladall, 1622 Silk Line. Okay, uh, one is for smaller properties, uh, like half acre, acre properties, what is considered, uh, how much topsoil could you store on your property for your gardens? That's number one, that wasn't specified at all. Uh, number two, for farmers with uh, manure piles that compost down the topsoil, how, uh, what are we doing about that? Or how is that going to be regulated and uh, uh, without causing any problems to water streams or no? So the bylaw does have an exclusion for agricultural purposes. Sorry, I'll answer this in, in two pieces. The, so the manure pile would be considered an agricultural practice and therefore wouldn't be covered by this bylaw. In relation to the topsoil storage for gardens, there is a provision, and I believe it's 200 millimeters for the surface area of your property. Um, so that's you know 20 centimeters of topsoil is a significant amount of topsoil, even if you had a half acre property. Did you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, I do have a follow-up. Uh, Please come to me. Uh, it's uh, last year our property got completely and totally flooded out from a beaver pond, and we lost all of our topsoil off our garden. So now we have we have zero topsoil left. So now, how much can I put on my property? I can't get a dump truck into my garden. So how much can I literally store that I can use? with my own tractor, my own equipment, bring my garden back to where it was, which I, as you say, but it was probably more than just what no it, It's, sorry, would, um, did you say 20 millimeters or 200? Lord, a, a simple answer for question like that. Uh, three yards, six yards, nine yards, top of four, if I'm going to use. So I believe, the provisions is um, a hundred cubic meters is where the the bylaw really starts to take effect. Yeah, through through the chair, if I can. Stork. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, just to be clear, the intent of this bylaw is to regulate mass importation of material. And so there are baseline exemptions, 100 cubic meters uh, is number one, and that's a significant quantity. Um, and then alteration of 20 centimeters throughout the entire property. So, Thank you, Mr. Burke. Is there any other public comments? Lynn Taylor, 1032 Taylor Mall. Uh, so I do have livestock on my property. So I'm looking for clarification around the adding of fill as it pertains to sand and limestone fill because of the nature of uh, the turnout areas, if you like, and the riding areas for my horses. So if I just want some clarification around how much sand fill and limestone fill can I bring in to assist with the footing for those horses? 
without being in contravention of this, not altering the, not near any um, waterways or altering any waterways. It's strictly where the horses are. Mr. Burke. So through the chair, the uh, the exemptions are very similar. So another 100 cubic meters, a significant quantity. Um, there's also some, if there was an addition to that, the application would be relatively straightforward um, as quarried material or material coming out of a product supplier um, doesn't have the same effect for excess oil regulations for testing. It, it's more of a product you purchase from the store, happens to be a quarry. Um, so that, that sort of thing is an easier route, but the general exemptions are 100 cubic meters per event, right? So if you had to do this once in a while, once per year, it doesn't aggregate through. Um, but uh, 100 cubic meters at a time and no more than 200 millimeters uh, throughout the surface area of your, of your property. So once again, a fairly large scale alteration of the site is required to trigger the fill permit and site alteration bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Are there any further public comments? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to move on to the members of the committee. Uh, do any of the members of the committee have any comments? <clears throat> Member Burkett? Thank you through the chair and thank you, uh, Mr. McNaughton for the presentation. Mr. Burke, just for clarity, 100 cubic meters I can't do the conversion just for the benefit of the two questions that were asked uh, in the audience. A tandem load of, of fill is how many cubic meters? Yeah, so it's it's uh, 10 cubic meters typically per load. So that's 12 yards, give or take, on a single, on a tandem maximum truck. Okay. So that's 10 um, loads. Yeah. So further supplementary from me through the chair. So anyone that wants to put say do their driveway and it requires 10 loads tandem loads of gravel it doesn't trigger this bylaw correct to the chair that's correct and if furthermore to what uh, mr gladall spoke to if he wanted to put 10 lo loads of topsoil on his property it doesn't trigger that as well again that's correct and Thank and some of the uh, things to note there are general pro prohibitions so things that would negatively affect the environment still apply, there's general prohibitions, but the permit wouldn't be required until greater than 100. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Member Cox. Okay, I want, I'd like to talk about, now I know what the smaller um, storage is, what's the larger storage and how long? Is it up to five years on one site? Through the chair to the, ever. <laughs> Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. So the short-term storage um, within, I, I believe it's it's a year, is allowed. Longer-term storage than that would only be available through a permitting process because they would be considered at that point a site alteration. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, but how much? Like how many cubic yards or how many cubic meters can someone just a great big pile and leave it there, like a larger one, not on a residential, it would be commercial. Uh, so, okay. That would be covered again under the 200 millimeters. I, I know that sounds weird, but if you've altered your site by more than 200 millimeters, right, then you've triggered bylaw. So if you're having a short-term storage for a day or two, that wouldn't trigger it. But if you are having 10 dump truck loads dumped in one area, you've made a major change in the slope of your site, you've changed your drainage, and then the, drywall, or the bylaw would then be enacted. Mr. Burke? So through the chair, um, perhaps I hear the question a little differently, is um, what would comply with Ontario Regulation 406, which is the excess soil regulations? And so the limits under that regulation are actually 10,000 cubic meters for a class two designated storage site. And the limits there again, are, I believe are one year um, with a destination with the destination defined. So 10,000 cubic meters in temporary storage would still trigger a permit though through this process. And through the chair to uh, Mr. Burke, can you, what does class two, like how do you get those classes? Like where do they come from? 
So through the chair, that's the uh, regulation 406 defines class one, two, and uh, I guess it's actually just the two classes. And uh, a class one soil uh, receiving site is uh, is a ministry regulated that actually has an environmental compliance approval. Um, and it's it's a commercial version of taking in excess soil, processing that excess soil, and then exporting that excess soil as either product or, or various destination. So through supplemental, so that would be like a landscape business, those types of things? Uh, probably significantly larger than a landscape company. And the other one I wanted to ask, um, I think it's already been, is the agriculture is exempt? Okay. And the reason that you aren't allowed to deliver topsoil on weekends is because of the whole bylaw? Like what if someone, you know, they're home on the weekend and they need their landscaper to bring in something. Mr. Burt? Like on a Sunday. Uh, okay, Mr. McNaughton. So, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're curious about uh, landscape alteration having the shipping arriving on a Saturday or Sunday because that's when the, the person would be home? Yes. So, if the landscaping is simply for a top dressing, then it wouldn't trigger the bylaw, which then is my understanding would be, if it's not triggering the bylaw, then it's not triggering the hull route, which is where that clause comes from. So would it be a dump truck that would be allowed to come and deliver on a Sunday then? Through the chair? The, I, these are questions people have asked me. <laughs> and I'm curious to know myself. S so under this bylaw, there would be no prohibition for it. I can't speak to other bylaws that are enacted in the township. Okay, thank you. Mr. Burke? So through the chair, perhaps the question relates to an existing bylaw on hull routes. Uh, I think it's a 2004 bylaw. Um, that actually only applies to the designated hull routes within the township. So that's Nichols Line, Burnside Line, Quarry Road, um, and a small part of uh, Fairgrounds Road. And so those those are that that bylaw applied to those roads. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Burkett. Thank you to the chair, to Mr. McNaughton. So you now we're now if we approve this bylaw, we'll be allowed to bring in fill from anywhere in Simcoe County. I know, for example, one uh, area, let's say uh, the Edenville Airport, soil that like there's millions of tons that have been brought into that airport. I'm not sure where they've done any testing. If we're going to allow other area, like other areas of the county to bring soil here, is there, and it may be in the report, I may have missed it, I'm sorry, but is there a mechanism to test that soil or go and look at that soil before it's actually transported here to our township? Yes, 100%. So. Um, under Regulation 406, there has to be a soil characterization report that's provided prior to the shipping of the soil, and that, that's in situ or stockpile testing done on the source site prior to being delivered. Uh, that testing record also has to be retained by the shipping company or the hauling company and has to be on, so, you know, um, 10 truckloads because it's it's 100 cubes is actually where the testing starts at so every 100 cubes that testing result has to be on the trucks so even if the MTO pulls over a truck that's transporting that soil they have to be able to produce said records of what that testing is and then in the bylaw there's a provision that those records are actually kept by the homeowner as well or, or property owner thank you uh, member Cox yeah just a Sorry, through the chair to Mr. McNaughton or to Mr. Burke, um, it said neighboring municipalities. That doesn't mean all of Simcoe County, or does it? Through the chair, I think I can address this one. <clears throat> so the pur the purpose of the statement there is we're kind of at the northern. Am I can you hear me? Okay, mm -hmm. um, we're at the northern limits of Simcoe County, and the intent of that provision in a previous bylaw was to limit the uh, the distance. You know, from an environmental standpoint, trucking hundreds and thousands of cubic meters of fill from the GTA 
is is a significant travel distance. It's a consumption of a ton of greenhouse gas um, producing emissions and and for what benefits. So we we have revised this to be adjacent neighboring municipalities to look at a radius approach rather than just in Simcoe County to which we're the northern part of that geographical boundary. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further comments from the committee? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the proposed tree conservation bylaw presentation. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, given how much discussion we expect on this, I've had a request for a quick five second bio break before we get into the tree cutting bylaw. <laughs> okay, we mind. will uh, take a recess of five minutes for a bio break.
Okay, thank you. We're back from our short break. Okay, moving on to the proposed tree conservation bylaw presentation, the township's planning consultant, Jamie Robinson from MHBC Barry will now provide an <laughs> overview of the proposed tree conservation bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of council and members of the public that are here and listening online. Again, my name is Jamie Robinson. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give a bit of a background about sort of how we got here, why we're here, uh, a little bit of an intro about the bylaw, the draft bylaw itself, and then hopefully some what what we're hoping to receive in terms of comments and feedbacks, and then what the next steps might look like with respect to this process. So that's kind of the roadmap where my presentation intends to go uh, this morning. If, um, I don't know, Allison, are you sharing or did you want Lee from my office to share? She's online. Lee, if you heard that, if you can share. So while she's doing that, I'll just uh, get going. So the purpose of today's session, so first off, there's this public meeting this morning there's also an open house meeting tonight in the council chambers where it's a bit of a, a walk around type session and uh, myself and Andrea, members of, and Lee from my office and uh, members of the planning staff here will be around to answer any questions and provide some background on the document as well. So there's these two opportunities that are being provided for public comment. In addition, uh, you're also free to submit comments at any time uh, if you don't have a chance to review the documents until later, you can provide your comments at uh, planning at Severn Township. Is it at Severn.ca? Okay, so that's planning at Severn.ca. So again, the purpose of the uh, of this open house is to get or this public meeting is to get feedback from members of the public. I'm sure we may hear some feedback from members of council once the public has an opportunity to provide their response as well. If you just want to go to the next slide, Lee, please. So just in terms of background in Simcoe County, so there, the Simp County of Simcoe does have a tree cutting bylaw and it applies to, to properties that are greater than one hectare in size. Uh, that's really the only tree cutting bylaw that exists or that does apply to, to Severn Township. So there's currently no bylaw in effect. How this came to be uh, and why this draft bylaw was prepared and why we're having this, this public uh these public sessions um there was a number of uh, council has written and members of council have received a number of comments from some folks around the municipality expressing concerns mainly related to some clear cutting of trees on shoreline properties primarily and uh, council had asked staff to investigate what options were available for regulating um, the removal of trees and that really precipitated in council passing a resolution directing staff to prepare a draft bylaw for consideration and review. Um, so that's that's really why we're here today. What I'd like to to first say is that typical process in in drafting bylaws is you often start a little larger and then it gets more scoped and refined following public consultation. So what I would expect as a result of the public input and the input we received uh, this morning and this evening is that the bylaw is likely to get scoped and refined further or it may get deleted get may not proceed in, at all in its entirety but I would expect that there would be some refinements it's much uh, more appropriate in a public setting to sort of start big and scope down as opposed to do the opposite because if you do the opposite you start small and then get bigger you would have to go through further notification processes as a result of that. So, so if you think that the um, the bylaws overreaching, those are the sorts of comments that I think we're looking to hear today. Um, what we're really looking to hear about is is if you think the bylaws overreaching from a geographic perspective, meaning it should only apply to shoreline areas, it should not apply to areas outside shoreline areas. Those are the type of comments we'd like to hear. If we, if you think that, for example, that the bylaw shouldn't apply to agricultural properties, then those are the sort of comments we want to hear. If you think the bylaw shouldn't apply to 
properties within settlement areas or should apply to properties within settlement areas. Those are sort of that's the sort of feedback we'd like to to receive. The other thing in drafting bylaws that we like to understand is what what's the purpose? What are you really trying to achieve in 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 drafting that bylaw? And I think there's two main things that are reasons why this this uh, this tree cutting bylaw has um, process has been initiated. And I think one reason would be from an aesthetics perspective is are we trying is is the reason for establishing a tree cutting bylaw to ensure that aesthetics, for example, of lake environments are maintained and that character of the shoreline area is maintained? Is that the reason? Or is the reason that uh, we want to uh, enact a tree cutting bylaw, for example, to ensure that water quality is maintained or, or the environment is maintained? Or is it for both of those reasons? Or is it for one reason within a settlement area or shoreline area and another reason for somewhere else? So those are the sort of comments that I think are really helpful if, if members of the public can provide, because it allows us to refine our drafting of the bylaws. What's the intent of what, what do you as an individual think this should achieve or should not achieve? And, uh, or maybe there's something else, maybe there's another reason for that uh, tree removal bylaw. But I think the two key reasons would be the character of the area, which is really aesthetics or from an environmental or water quality perspective. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Lee, that'd be great. So in terms of the, uh, the lands that this draft bylaw applies to, um, how we structured it was in it, and there's really three components of it. So the first is that it would apply to all areas within 60 meters of a navigable water. So what, what, what's a navigable waterway? It's really a lake or it's a river that you can put a boat in or a canoe in that you can navigate down. This bylaw includes a definition of, the, of a navigable waterway, and we took that definition from the Navigable Waters Act. So it's the same definition that applies to that piece of legislation. So in terms of um, of where this would apply, so it would apply if you're within 60 meters of, of the navigable waterway or, or a lake or a river, if you're locate, if you're located within the shoreline residential designation, so effectively shoreline residential properties. If you're a marina, for example, it would not apply to you because marinas aren't within the shoreline residential designation. They're within a different designation. Or if you're within uh, 60 meters of navigable waterway and you're within the Greenlands designation in the OP, natural heritage designation in the OP, or environmental protection area designation in the official plan. So basically what that's saying is that if you're within a 60 meters of navigable waterway and you're within a rural designation or an agricultural designation or residential designation that's not shoreline, then it does not apply. The bylaw does not apply. It only applies within those specific areas. Where it also would apply is on all lands with, on an island. We're effectively thinking that all lands within islands are going to be 60 meters more or less within a within a a waterway, so that's why we included all islands. Really, the majority of islands are um, on Gloucester Pool, I think, for the most part in the municipality anyways. Um, and then third, it would apply to all land zoned environmental protection within the township. So this is, that's a bit, so that environmental protection um, zone, so you'll see a few different things here. First, under B, under A, 1A and B, it refers to the official plan and designations that are in the official plan. And under three, it refers to environmental protection zoning. So uh, in applying the bylaw or reviewing it, you'd have to look at both the mapping of the OP and of the zoning bylaw. By OP, I mean official plan. So um, what that would mean and, and why that's important is that uh, in a rural perspective or an agricultural perspective, typically lands within a certain distance of, let's say the Coldwater River or the North River, for example, are usually zoned environmental protection. So that tree cutting bylaw would apply to those lands that are in proximity. 
if you're in that even if you're in that agricultural designation because of the zoning that applies on your property so that's an important thing for folks to consider and i expect we'll hear comments on that sort of thing today on whether it should apply in those instances or not but again i think it comes back to what's the purpose of it is it for aesthetics or is it for environmental reasons or is it for and water quality reasons or is it for both if you want to flip to the next slide, please, Lee. Uh, I don't know if we can make, can we make this any bigger, Allison? So uh, while Allison tries to make this a little bit larger, I think Lee's trying to make it bigger there. Perfect. So what we did here was provide now this is just a sample sketch an illustration to demonstrate how the bylaw would apply in a shoreline area so what this this diagram illustrates is it shows in the beige beige I'll call it overlay it identifies a 60 meter buffer of the shoreline so if you took the shoreline and set back a line 60 meters from that that's what's identified sort of on the ribbon that's adjacent to the shoreline. In the hatched area that's also identified in beige, um, that area is an environmental protection zone in the bylaw. So in the zoning bylaw, so it would apply to that area of, of this property. And this sketch also shows the lot lines on the property. So effectively, if this landowner wanted to remove trees on any area that's identified in beige on the property, both the 60 meters of the shoreline or within the EP, um, they would need to get uh, permission in accordance with the bylaw. And, and I'll get into that permission and permitting piece in a second. If they wanted to remove trees in the central portion of the property that's not covered, then they would not need any sort of permit. And I've got a few maps that, that provide some illustrations for the rest of the municipality. And we've got some boards that that we'll have set up tonight to that folks can look at and see if their property would be subject to the to the proposed bylaw based on this this draft. So what we're really looking for in terms of comments is that area that's identified appropriate. Is it too big? Is it too small? Or should it even exist at all? If you go to the next slide, please, Lee. Um, so yeah, just this scales a little difficult to see here or, or, or quite difficult to see, but these are the, the boards that we've also got that, that we'll have available for this evening. Um, I can also provide them after the meeting. If folks want to stick around, I can set them up at the back so they can have a look at them all as well. Oh, and they're online. They're online as well uh, on the township's website for those of you that are reviewing virtually. But it, what this identifies in, in beige are those areas that uh, on the first slide that we identified. So the areas that are within 60 meters of a navigable waterway that are within those natural heritage, environmental protection, Greenlands designation, and then also those lands that are zoned environmental protection within the municipality. If you go to the next slide, please, Lee. So this it, this figure shows the southern portion of of the municipality, and just go to the next slide. So yeah, I would encourage folks to take a look online at the at the maps and check out their properties or neighboring properties and see if if these illustrations are are correct. But they're really intended just to provide an overview and and a summary of where the the bylaw would apply. Uh, just go to the so. We've also got blow ups of each of the settlement areas. If you just want to flip to the next one as well. And uh, so that that those blow ups of the settlements provide a bit of a bit of background and detail. So just in terms of exemptions, the way the bylaws set is set up is it applies to those specific areas. And then there's a list of exemptions that that are outlined. So things that are exempted from the, the draft bylaw are, are activities undertaken by the municipality, activities undertaken by a license issued with the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. So if you've got a, a managed forest on your property, for example, and even if it's, it's zoned environmental protection, the bylaw wouldn't apply in those instances. If you are, if it's a surveyor that has to undertake survey work, the bylaw doesn't apply because they often have to cut through 
wetlands or environmental type areas to undertake their work. If you've got a dead or a hazard tree in your property, you don't need no don't need any sort of uh, permit. The bylaw would, does not apply in those instances. Next example. Uh, if you just go to the next slide. So in terms of development specific, so if you've undertaken any sort of planning act approval, if you've got site plan or got permission to construct, uh, to, to get a building permit for your property in those instances, the bylaw doesn't apply as well. So it provides relief where there's there's been permission granted through either the building permit process or planning act process. Next slide, please. So just in terms of next steps, uh, what we intend to do is consider the feedback that's been provided at the open house and uh, and at this session today. Uh, what we would do then is uh, we prepare some some proposed modifications to the bylaw. We do want to have a discussion following that with county staff and with MNR staff just to review the the uh, the bylaw that's that's uh, really sort of in a, in a final form, and then we would uh, proceed then to council with a recommendation report on. And through that, what we intend to do is we'll be providing a comment summary table as part of that, that identifies any comments that are provided by members of the public, that identify how they've been considered, and, and it references how those comments have been considered in the final, final iteration of the bylaw. Uh, so what I would encourage is if, you, uh, if you're making comments, if you do want to provide um, provide an email or written comments, it just helps us make sure we've really accurately reflected exactly what your comment is, and we get the have a good chance to respond to that as well, and we don't miss anything. So I would encourage everyone, even if they're making verbal comments, to try to do that. We will be taking notes, but that's uh, that's an important thing to do. So that really uh, outlines the process. Again, just keep in the back of your mind as you're providing comments or thinking about uh, about this, what uh, A, if you think it's necessary at all, B, if you think it's necessary, um, uh, what are you, what do you think it's necessary for? Is it for the, the aesthetic reasons? Is it for the environmental reasons? And then C, sort of geographically do all Environmental in another area or consistently across the board. So, um, um, for those that are attending online, we've had a bit of a power outage here at the office. So, um, we're hoping the live stream is still working for you. Um, it looks like the Zoom is. So, we will attempt to still take your feedback and such. So, give us a moment to work through the technical challenges. <laughs> Madam Clerk, can I carry on then? Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Robinson, for your comments and your presentation. I will move on to public questions and comments. Any persons present on, present on Zoom or are on the telephone who have either questions or comments on the proposed tree conservation bylaw will now be invited to speak. Please turn on your camera and raise your hand once it's ready. Uh, Zoom, Zoom link's ready. Uh, if you have any comments or questions. You will be required to give your full name and address for the minutes. Please note that your comments will also be recorded and live streamed on the Township's YouTube channel and will remain online. The Township does not have the ability to edit the live stream to remove any I understand that Ms. Hill will, uh, will start and go through the list of those who have registered to speak uh, that are online currently or have called in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so as noted, we do have a list of attendees who have registered to speak on Zoom. Um, they are sorted in order by last name. Um, so we will call you and you'll be welcome to unmute your mic 
um, and turn on your camera if you'd wish. Um, please make sure to provide your name and address for the clerk for the minutes. Um, I do recognize that there are some folks on Zoom who might not have registered in advance. Um, there will be opportunity um, later on for anyone who hasn't had, um, who hadn't registered in advance to uh, provide any comments or questions as well. Uh, so we'll start with Irene Boulanger, uh, who is registered to attend on Zoom. I'm not seeing anyone turning on their camera or raising their hand, so we'll move to the next participants. Um, those would be Linda and Patrick Cooley. The next participant who is registered to attend on Zoom is David Durden. Um, the next person registered to attend on Zoom is Cheryl Elliott Frazier of the Gloucester Pool Cottagers Association. Hello. We can hear you, Cheryl. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for, uh, uh, yeah, as mentioned, I'm Cheryl Elliott Fraser, the president of the Gloucester Pool Cottagers Association. Uh, our, our, we have uh, a few concerns, and that is that um, we are very concerned about uh, property owners that uh, harvest trees commercially. We don't feel that this particular bylaw should be applying to them at all. We were under the assumption that it didn't, but then we, we saw some feedback on um, Facebook that showed that maybe it does apply to them. We feel very strongly that a tree conservation bylaw should really only be applied to lakefront properties and properties that feed into lakes and uh, lakes between the lakes. Um, we are concerned with the definition that you're using in terms of shoreline definition. Uh, we think it needs to be tighter and more pre more precise. Uh, we're also concerned about the whole 60 meter from the waterfront. Uh, we think that that's a bit too much in terms of the distance. We don't think that's realistic. You notice that the Halliburton Township uses 30 meters um, in, in terms of it. So we're thinking that that is uh, the distance may not be reasonable. We'd also like to see a list of invasive species that are exempt from the bylaw, for example, buckthorn. We feel that owners should be able to be able to go in and, and uh, cut down buckthorn. As it stands, it appears that they wouldn't be able to cut down buckthorn. Um, we're also concerned too with, uh, sorry, with the whole uh, fire prevention issue. The federal and provincial governments, and specifically MNRF, as well as the Federation of Cottage Associations of Ontario, are encouraging residents to implement. So, Cheryl. Yes. Hello. Um, we lost power here again, so we can't. We couldn't hear you for a minute, so you need to back up. Oh, okay. So, where did um, did you hear? there um sorry what it does is it provides strategies to minimize home and properties vulnerability to wildland fires by addressing threats so one of the things that it's suggesting is um between zero and point 1.5 structure uh, um sorry meters from a home that you should have it completely cleared when you get up from 10 meters and beyond it's saying that trees need to be spaced three meters apart there's a lot of people who don't have that on their land. They would have, they'll have uh, would, um, trees that are pretty close together. If they wanted to comply or they wanted to put these strategies in place, would they need to have permits? According to the according to what we're reading, um, with regards to this um, if bylaw, that they would need to have permits in order to do this. Um, as you're aware, there were three fires on Glacier Pool two years ago, and the property of um, two years ago, and there are property owners that are looking at strategies to put in place to ensure that um, you know that their their places don't go up and their woodlots don't go up um, in smoke. I'm also wondering too if there if these are tied into some of these strategies are tied into what Ontario Woodlot Association is is suggesting in terms of conservation. Um, 
in terms of our our position, we're really feeling we would like to see a bylaw that really looks at um, preventing clear cutting on shoreline. We would like to see um, water quality maintain, but it's more we're more concerned about putting strategies in place that are going to cut to prevent clear cutting, and not we're also concerned about the amount of restrictions that have been imposed that that this uh, bylaw seems to be imposing um uh, yeah and and so that just just a answering that question so that's where we're coming from right now um in terms of of uh, our feelings about the bylaw thank you thank you miss elliot fraser do we have any comments uh, from staff or mr robinson i don't think i need to provide any any comments? I think their their comments were well done, and we've got notes, and certainly consider them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Miss Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so we'll move on to the uh, next individuals registered on Zoom. Um, so the next person by order of last name is Justin Gerardin. Justin, if you would like to unmute your microphone and turn your camera on, you're welcome to. Um, and please provide your address for the minutes. Hello, good day, uh, Justin Gerardin, 245 to uh, McLean Lake. My uh, my uh, main concern is with regards to the, to the 60 meters. Um, my lot is a, a vacant lot, water access only. Um, and 60 meters I find is, a, is excessive to a pr pr uh, protect a shoreline or aesthetics or um, that basically, my lot is severed into two parts and uh, 60 meters is essentially the the my whole entire shoreline uh, part that I would eventually build a, a future cottage on. So that basically takes the entire portion of my lot uh, that I would build on to be under this act. So I'm just concerned with the the, the 60 meters and uh, the requirements for for what this permit actually is. Thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you for your comments, Mr. Jaredin. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the next registered uh, folks on Zoom are Karen and Ken Kane. I'm not seeing anyone turning on their uh, microphone or camera. Uh, so we'll go on to the next participant. Um, again, there'll be opportunity to speak later on should you have any additional comments or questions following the discussion. Um, so the next individual is Eric Melier. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Uh, Eric Mallier, 5599 Upper Big Shoot Road, Coldwater. Um, I have con some concerns around the uh, proposed bylaw. Uh, trees grow and um, they grow quite quickly, especially as they, they mature. So they, they need to be managed. They need to be culled. Now, is that, so. is that something that is part of the hazard or dead tree provision. Yeah. So that's a question. Uh, the 60 meters, that does seem um, to encroach into the property from the shorelines uh, quite a bit. So I think that's um, that's something definitely has to be looked at. Uh, if it's if it's strictly, I, I'm not clear on what the bylaw is trying to achieve. Is it conservation? Is it environment? Is it Aesthetics. If it's strictly aesthetics, I would question the need for a bylaw. Period. Um, that seems to be a big undertaking to put in a bylaw just uh, for aesthetics and things like that. Uh, let's see, it, it, is this um, a provincial requirement? Like, is is the uh, provincial government brought down legislation or created some uh, process whereby? trees need to be managed on properties nowadays. So th that's another piece that uh, should be looked at here. Uh, we have enough regulations coming down. So unless it's a, 
you know, a decree that's come down on high. I mean, why are we looking at it? And uh, so building additional structures on a property, if somebody has to put in a, uh, or wants to put in a garage or uh, an addition on a, uh, an existing structure, so is the, and trees have to be removed. That's outside of this bylaw and that's going to be captured in the building permit application process. Am I to understand that correctly as well? Those are my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malaya. Uh, moving on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the next registered individual on Zoom is Daryl Phillips. Not seeing anyone uh, raising their hand and turning on their camera. Um, so the next participant is Claude Briggs. Morning. Can I go ahead? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Claude Ricks, uh, my cottage address is 4014 East Shore Road um, in Severn Township. I, uh, my home residence is in Barrie. Um, I am the uh, one of the co-chairs of uh, another committee, uh, the Coalition uh, Fighting Against Floating Homes, and have worked on several other issues with this council, uh, specifically Mark and Mayor uh, Burkett, find them to be genuine, reasonable, and logical guys. So I just wanted to state that comment at the front um, that will help you understand my concerns. Uh, <clears throat> the genesis of this, this bylaw or this proposed bylaw uh, is the result of a gentleman that is 10 cottages down the road from me. And uh, without, you know, with, Without naming names, this gentleman. Okay. Hello. Sorry, okay. please. Proceed. We just had a couple of folks we lost when the power outage happened that are slowly coming back into the meeting. So, just Can please. I continue proceed. or should I wait? No, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, the gentleman, I, I'd like to just characterize his, his his character because it will clearly point to we are. Um, using a bazooka gun uh, when we don't need to in terms of uh, oversizing this bylaw. The gentleman in question, the property in question that you received all the feedback for, he clear, clearly raised an entire property, an entire shoreline. It looks terrible and it was terrible. This particular uh, person um, has no care for what he did. Uh, I know many of the uh, cottagers on East Shore Road uh, and Tower Line, there's 135 of us, I know many of them. For 25 years, I have not found anybody do exactly what this guy did. He is one of the bad apples. Um, we can go into that, but I'm not going to. He's just a bad apple. Um, I struggle with a bylaw framework that basically is trying to manage bad apples. We all have cottage properties. We all love our cottage properties. We all love our trees. I don't want to have to deal with a 60 meter setback from the water if I choose to clear out a tree, whether it's damaged or dead, or just, you know, I'm clearing the way for, uh, for, for tree management for other trees to grow. I would offer as my feedback that the setback, if we were to do a law like this, might be aligned to the bylaw setback of 20 meters from shoreline. That might be more reasonable. And one other um, comment might be, it is okay to take a tree or two out, but uh, there's a percentage or a density question that needs to be put into this. I'm fine with people taking a tree or two out of their uh, of, of their sight lines and still respecting the uh, shoreline that they've got. Um, we're trying to manage, you know, the what normal people do. The, this bylaw stemmed or the genesis of it was from essentially a sociopath and the, 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 this is not how we build bylaws. Anyway, uh, my feedback, um, thanks for your consideration and I'll uh, mute out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rex, for your comments. Ms. Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do see one of the participants um, who might have gotten booted out during the uh, power outage there does have their hand raised. Um, Daryl Phillips, uh, if you would like to um, turn on your camera and unmute your microphone um, and please provide your address for the clerk. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, Daryl Phillips, 2588 McLean Lake. Um, are you actually going to answer any questions at this time or just taking comments? Because I, I do have one question I think is uh, pertinent. Mr. Burke or Mr. Robinson? Yes, they will. Okay, so I already see this as just more red tape that's required when doing anything on a private lot. Um, but the big issue is that your proposed bylaw doesn't actually stipulate what's required for a permit or what considerations will be taken into account. <clears throat> so I guess my question is that what will be the permit process? Will you have to have somebody come out and sur survey the property, count how many trees are there, tell you how many can be cut down of what, what's remaining? Like, you know, what is this actually going to look like? Mr. Robinson? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the commenter. You're correct. There's been no details outlined yet in terms of what a permitting process might look like or when a permit would specifically be required. Effectively, the permit would be required if, if you're not exempt under the bylaw from removing the trees in your property. But in terms of how the that operationally gets undertaken, those details have not been sorted out yet. Um, we weren't going to go through the process of detailing a permitting program if the bylaw wasn't going to proceed forward at the end of the day. So, but you are absolutely correct that there will need to be a permitting process if it if it gets to that point. And there's reasons okay. associated with that as well. So <laughs> that will be something that if council proceeds with this bylaw, that part of our recommendation report will provide some details about how that permitting process would unfold and what sort of resources would be necessary to so Okay, um, I guess I answer that question. So just with my overall thoughts on this, it, I agree with the previous commenter. It seems to be just overreaching. Uh, it's additional red tape for anybody who wants to do anything to their private property. We've already gotten to a point in life where you can't do anything on your land without a permit. So the only thing you can do is stand on it and you know, even having a campfire requires a permit. This is just one more thing, one more hoop that people have to jump to, to do anything on their own private property and it, it just seems unnecessary. Um, I can't see many people wanting to clear cut their lots, especially cottage lots on waterfront, where this would actually be required. Okay, thank you for your comments, Mr. Phillips. Ms. Hill? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the last registered participant on Zoom um, is Travis Van England from SSCA. Uh, Travis, I'm not sure if you're just observing, if you have any comments, but feel free for to uh, turn your camera on and unmute your mic if you'd like to speak. Okay, seeing no comments, we'll move on. If there are any members of the public present in the council chambers, I apologize, Madam Clerk. That's okay. Um, we had one more that fell off that is now back on Zoom that had registered. Uh, so I believe that is uh, Linda Cooley, um, who had registered and got bumped off. And so she is dialed in now via phone. So um, if Linda, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to. Just for those that didn't pre-register, um, we're gonna go through the registered speakers and then there's got some in chambers too that have registered to speak. And then we'll come back to those that haven't registered at this point in time. So um, for those that are on Zoom that haven't had a chance to speak yet, please just bear with us while we work through those that did uh, register in advance. Okay, Ms. Cooley, would you like an opportunity to speak? <laughs> Okay, we will move on. If there are any members of the public present in council chambers who would like to speak, please raise your hand. I know that there's a list uh, that we'll go through uh, first. Uh, you will be required to give your name and address for the minutes. We will start with those that are pre-registered to speak, and then we'll open up the floor for any additional comments or questions. Ms. Hill? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we'll go the same in order by last name of those who have registered. Um, so the first individual attending in person is Rick Buchanan. Hello? 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 Fucking ridiculous. Uh, Miss 
<laughs> oh, Miss uh, Cooley, you weren't on on mute uh, at at that uh, second there, but we will allow you to have a say if you would like to proceed at this time. Uh, Miss Miss Cooley, are you trying to speak? Okay, once again, we will move on. Uh, Mr. Uh, Buchanan. Not here? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the next individuals are Jim Gladwell and Carrie DeLarge. So uh, I guess you no know, Jim Gladwell, sixteen twenty two South Line. No, is it working? Oh. Uh, I, I quickly looked up uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources for logging in Northern Ontario requires a uh, minimum of one hundred twenty meters setback, and that's also water drainage sediments and everything else. So your twenty meters right now that you have for by law. There, I don't think you need to increase it anymore. I'm just to get my notes. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to mention some family names here. So families like the Silk, Sternfords, Loverings, Gladalls, Taylors have for decades, going on a century, managed to keep healthy bush pots and manage and pr produce um, sugar bushes. So why is this necessary? Necessary other than to lord control over residents. Uh, who would supersede? Just as I mentioned with M and R. Uh, with their logging centers, so and county, so who supersedes uh, township, county, or provincial? Is there the one person mentioned over uh, fire prevention? So uh, who do we listen to? Do we do you take precedence, or does the uh, ministry take precedence? So Jim, I just said sorry. I had some people online just saying they can't hear you. So if you oh, don't mind sure. speaking into the mic, that would be appreciated. <laughs> So maybe I can just summarize the the question was that um, if there's competing jurisdictions, be it the MNR or provincial jurisdiction or county or township, who super like who's the yeah, who so. who supersedes each other in those instances? So it's really um, there's no one one size fits all answer to that question. It really depends on the nature of the work being undertaken, which which bylaw or which law it falls under so I, I can't really answer that specifically it'd really be done on a case-by-case -case basis and you'd have to evaluate the legislation so okay. for example if it was a if it was a logging operation that's undertaken then this bylaw doesn't apply to to logging operations even, like if, it's on, even if it's on private property correct yeah okay. so that would be covered by mnr or or county logging. Okay. Or county so that, that leads me into another one. We have uh, uh, Corey on uh, Corey Road there that's stripping right now uh, well within an environmentally protected area. And yet we're cutting down hundreds of acres of trees. So that's allowed, but we're not allowed to cut a tree on our property. So that doesn't seem to be actually very fair. Yes, yeah, so that specific type of an example would be an example of where this bylaw provides exemptions. Like, just it's a larger context, but if you've got planning wow. approvals or site plan approvals, which an aggregate operation would have those in place, then that planning approvals are for them, and they've got an ARA approval through the Aggregate Resources Act that would supersede and that would exempt them from this sort of a bylaw. So, yay for they and nay for me. Okay, got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. It, if I can just remind members of the public to uh, speak into the microphone, just so that members uh, on Zoom are able to uh, to hear all of the question, um, so that they're aware of, of what you are trying to say. Thank right. you. So that would be covered by uh, Thank you, Chair. The uh, next person registered to attend in person um, is Gail Haverson. Oh. Five River Walk Drive, Coldwater. 
And uh, we live in uh, Riverwalk Estates in Coldwater. And we have a buffer zone of 50 feet in from the river. And our trees are dying at an alarming rate. And um, we just need, these trees are mostly ash trees. And we have a registered arborist, Amic Tree Service. And so we've dealt with him since day one. And I guess my question is, what do we need to do about these trees? Like we have people complaining because they're afraid trees are gonna fall on their homes. And um, and so we have to we have to let Andrea Woodrow know when we're when we're removing trees. So um, I guess my question is, what what do we do about these trees? Like we have um, we're to let Andrea know when we're when we're uh, removing trees. So um, yeah. I guess my question is, what do we need to do about these trees that are coming down? Thank you for your questions, Ms. Haverstock. My understanding of the bylaw is that dead or diseased trees are exempt from the bylaw. Uh, Mr. Robinson? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. It's a little bit of a unique circumstance in Riverwalk because um, that area, it's not zoned EP or anything like that there's a development agreement and the reason you're contacting Andrea is because of the development agreement. It's effectively like a site plan agreement and it provides some details about that being a vegetation preservation area. So that's why that it's a, it's a very unique situation is I guess what I can get at, but does the development agreement likely provides exemptions for, for hazard trees I'm assuming, but maybe I'll flip that over to you. Sorry, put me on the spot. If I may, Mr. Chair, just to add an additional comment. Yes, the development agreement stipulates uh, that your arborist that you've retained would yeah. provide us with reports with respect to any dead or dying trees and how they would be exempt uh, in that regard. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the next individuals attending in person are Jim and Karen Pynchon. Um, my biggest problem. Oh, you've got all. Um, my biggest problem with forestry is that the disease situation is absolutely wiping out my forests. I have probably sixty-five acres or so of forest land. And there are at least 6,000, maybe 10,000 trees. Those fall, they knock other, other trees down. It's, it's a major problem, and we're getting no help from that, from this bylaw, for that problem. The township could do something to help because every other level of government is washing their hands of it. Um, we need trees to replace what we've lost. Um, also, uh, my my house is located on 14 acres of property. The zones on it are environmental protection, shore, no, no, shoreline residential seems to be gone now, and green line. Um, <clears throat> there are, are trees within 10 feet of my house that were nice and easy to contain before. They are now 65 feet high. They need to come down. I have hundreds of trees on the property. You know, thinning them, it should not be an issue. <clears throat> I think this whole, this whole um, bylaw is way overkill. Most of us that own property with trees on it want trees. We're not trying to clear cut the land. But we need to be able to control growth. And that's basically all I have to say about this. I think this is not a necessary function. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pynchon. 
Uh, Mr. Robinson? Yeah, if I may just, I, this kind of relates to that comment in the previous one, and I should have mentioned this for clarification previously. Um, I don't want folks to think that they need, that the way, this, so the way the bylaw is currently drafted is that um, it does not require an arborist opinion for removing dead or dangerously or severely injured trees. There's no requirement for that. You can do it, you're exempt from the bylaw. What it does require an arborist for is if if you're saying if you've got a tree that looks healthy, but you're telling somebody it's got some kind of disease, then it would require an arborist to comment on that in order to take it down if you're subject to the, the bylaw. So it's not like every time you want to take a tree down on your property, you need to get an arborist based on the way the bylaw is written. It's and right. and those sorts of examples that were just provided of damage, their safety hazards, the ash are all dying. Um, in proximity to your house or whatnot, you would not, you're exempt. The bylaw exempts those sort of circumstances. So I just wanted to make that that point clear. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Moving on. Uh, thank you, Chair. The uh, next individual attending in person is Nancy Robinson. <laughs> thank you, Chair. We'll move on to the next. Uh, Richard Shedd. <laughs> Um, and the last person we have who registered in advance in person is uh, Tony Telford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions and comments. Whether you get answered now, I will also forward this in writing too. Uh, it sounds like there is not a lot of instances of clear cutting that's happening. I'd like to know how many instances that this has generated that has happened that has generated this cost and this meeting and this bylaw. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You've answered a lot of the questions. The dead or if I do cut down a tree, am I going to get a complaint from a neighbor <clears throat> and then have a bylaw officer show up? Do I get a phone call first? Because if it's because they don't like the way the tree that particular tree came down, neither are welcome on my, on my property. Just so the definition of aesthetics, I don't think so. The last, if we decide that that bylaw must go through, I think it would be pertinent to have a, another meeting to, to, to explain the process, as Mr. Robinson says. I don't think you have to go through that right now because we don't even, we're not even there yet. But that way we could understand, like I've, I've lived here for 62 years and I'm gonna get visited by somebody who may or may not know the business end of a chainsaw. So I think that's the expertise, if this does go through, is, is has to be made clear. And finally, I agree with a lot of the comments. If it does go through, 60 meters is way too far. It's just, just not, uh, not acceptable. And to be clear and clarify, no, we do not need this bylaw, period. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. The clerk has notified me that she has an additional list of folks who registered in advance. Um, so if the clerk would like to invite those people to speak. Certainly, so we have Jamie Pincham, who wanted to come up and speak. He did, sorry, apologies if you've already been up. Um, and then Lynn Taylor. I do have um, green lands and envir environmentally protected lands on my property. So my concern is currently we try to do our due diligence and manage the property accordingly. I have in excess of 20 acres. So we're trying to do the right thing for the land. I don't see the need for this bylaw to be so um, overstepping over the environmentally protected in Greenlands um, without some really strict guidelines. Because right now we do have a number of trees that are dying, rotting, and diseased, and nobody is helping us manage it. We're managing it at our own cost and we're doing it appropriately and responsibly. So I have concerns with this bylaw 
in its entirety. Thank you. And, and Lynn, if I can just get your address on record. 1032 Taylor Line. Okay, moving on. At this time, we'll go back to those that had not registered online. Um, is there anyone else in person that would want to speak first? Okay, we'll cover those. There's a smaller crowd here than there is online, so we'll deal with those in person first. Hang in there. Um, sir, if you'd like to come up, I'll need your uh, name and address. Thank you. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Uh, Keith Prentice, 2400 Kinnear Side Road. Uh, I'm not here to hash out details of this bylaw. This is a yes or no question. Are we doing it or not? Um, I'm going to give you the reasons why we're not doing it. Uh, a, it's not necessary. B, it's going to further create a two-tier system in this township where those who can will, they won't ask permission, and the fines won't bother them in the slightest. Um, it's also going to open this township up to liability. In my research, I looked into some townships that have some, and uh, it, there's been a lot of li lawsuits over this. You know, somebody fires up a chainsaw, whether they have a permit or not. Uh, a neighbor complains about a tree coming down, and now we're trying to figure out whether that tree was, in fact, dead, dying, or injured, and who proves that and how. And that will lead to further costs for the taxpayer uh, through permit fees, which are completely unnecessary. And I know we're saying there's none for this, but there will be eventually, uh, particularly when the costs start to spiral out of control because the township is required to hire a forester or an arborist to cover these questions of who knows whether these trees are dead or dying. Uh, there's a precedence for this and it's been set. There's further liability, uh, as Jamie mentioned, about overseeing bodies. Uh, you know, I, I can totally foresee where I'm on my property cutting down trees under my managed forest plan. I get a visit from a bylaw officer. That bylaw officer is not going to ask to see my forest plan, it's not going to understand the law, simply going to fine me in which case I'm going to sue the township. Um, and, and without a doubt, uh, no provision was given to good forestry practice or invasive species, any of these things. Um, and and the, the biggest one that concerned me that came up in this meeting is I don't see how council could vote not knowing what the permit process was. Uh, it seems a big ask, and maybe that'll be part of the process, but it seems a big ask to ask you guys to say, yes to a bylaw not knowing what the final rules are going to be and uh that's it for me okay thank you mr prentice it's my understanding that there is no vote that that will take place today on the bylaw in particular um moving on so i believe um uh... Linda, are you there? Oh, sorry, sir. Um, I oh, Mr. Levering, apologies, Linda. Can you hear me this time? <laughs> Hello? Yes, please go. I don't know who there. Am I unmuted, Pat? Hi, uh, Ms. Pooley, we can hear you. So if you wanted to go ahead and provide um, your name and address for the minutes, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, it's Linda Coolis, C O U L I S, 3212 Fairgrounds Road in Severn. Can I keep speaking? Yes, please proceed. Okay, uh, a few things that I, I wanted uh, on record is uh, one, uh, I agree with one of the previous um, people speaking that. This seems to have come out of one person that has clear cut a lot to build a house. And my understanding for building permits, you need all types of uh, surveys and planners and environmental surveys. So somebody would have to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, does that not state how many trees you can cut and uh, what you can do exactly with the property when you're building a house and how big your house can be on the property. Uh, so somebody would have to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think you need a, a tree bylaw to deal with one person that hasn't followed the rules and uh, make it affect everybody else where we're going to have to call for permits. Uh, it's going to make your office busier. It's going to cost us money for permits. 
you always add additional things like you need an arborist or an environmental plan or which trees you can cut, which trees you can. I think uh, people that have property with trees, like us, we have 48 acres and it's mostly treed. Uh, when we moved here, we put in uh, a wood stove because we heat our home to save ourselves money. So it was properly installed and inspected and it's insured. So it's, uh, especially with the cost of living these days, it makes a difference. We cut our own trees. Uh, we've been doing it for 23 years. We've been here. We have plenty of trees on our lot. We're not clear cutting the lot. Uh, like most people involved in these meetings, uh, they don't want to clear all the trees off their lot. That's why they buy tree lots and they can manage it their own. They don't need uh, extra government overreach. That's not necessary as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and you're just going to cost us more money and tie up more of your staff. And I'm sure you have better things to do. Um, also, right now you're saying it only applies to uh, certain areas, people on the waterfront and um, environmentally protected. Who says down the road you're not going to update it to include uh, other properties? We have green land. I heard another lady say she had green land. She seems to be able to manage her property uh, just like we are. Um, we pay our taxes already and I don't feel that we need to pay more money uh, for one person that hasn't followed the rules. I think you need to look into that one person and deal with that one person. And um, I guess I'd want to know because you said you haven't, if there's a permit process, uh, like the person previously said, you don't have anything in place. so. Do you have to get a permit every time you want to cut one tree? Is it a permit for the entire year? Uh, what's the cost going to be? Um, and is that it? A permit? Do I have to tell you how many trees I'm going to cut to heat my house? There's just so much involved and it's not necessary. Again, I've been here 23 years. We have 48 acres. We've been heating for that long and we have more than enough trees on our property and I don't feel it's necessary to have this bylaw come into place for one person. Do you have anything you want to add to that? So we're on Greenland right now. It looks like on your maps that we're not included in that, but uh, there's always updates, just like you just updated your, your soil um, plan from 2011. Who says you're not going to start changing it and uh, adding more people's property uh, rather than just people who are on on waterways. So I think that covers everything that uh, um, uh, and um, when I would just like to add one thing if there's a permit and you have 48 acres is there going to be a limit to say okay you have 48 acres of trees you can cut 200 trees down to me, you need to manage your own property. You don't want too many trees. And if you don't cut some trees on your property, it's a fire hazard as well, if there's ever a forest fire. So it's just not reasonable to think that the township can manage all the tree properties in all of Severn Township. Again, it needs to be dealt with. The one person that cut clear cut their lot that I'm gonna assume weren't allowed to do that, you need to deal with them, not make the rest of us suffer and pay extra money. That's everything. Okay, thank you, Ms. Coolis, for your comments. I will move on to uh, Mr. Lovern. Uh, Steve Lovering, 2653 Upper Big Chute Road. I'm a local farmer and uh, arborist. I own a prop approximately a mile on the North River, Navigable River. I own both sides. Uh, this bylaw would prevent me from cutting within 200 feet of the shoreline of that river. Would affect my home heating, would affect my business, would affect my sugar bush. It has many effects on me. So I'm opposed to it. I don't wanna see anybody clear cutting any lots on Gloucester Pool, a beautiful place. It shouldn't be done, but um, I really feel that uh, this bylaw is not specific enough or should be totally opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovering. Is there any other public 
comments, please come forward at this time. Are there any members of the public that are online that would like to make a comment at this time? Please identify yourself. <laughs> Ms. Hill? Uh, thank you, Chair. It looks like um, an individual uh, named Eric has their hand raised um, if they'd like to. Uh, there you go. Thank you. I, uh, previously, I identified myself, Eric Mallier, 5599, Upper Big Shoot Road, Polar. Um, there, was a, there was a couple comments. The Honorable Council Member mentioned that uh, there is no process at this point for uh, this particular bylaw, but a subsequent comment said that you would have to engage an arborist to get a permit. So it really sounds like it's not going to be just a simple permitting process, uh, but it will require, you know, outside consultants to be involved. So to cut a tree down, I can I can see the cost of this just spiraling out of control. And uh, again, it, it's just another uh, reason in addition to the many that have already been voiced as to why really this this uh, should not go forward. It, it's really spiraling out of control already. So I, I heard that the, there is no process, but I, I also heard that there are pieces of the process that are already in and they seem to be fairly restrictive already. So just another comment in support of why do we need this? I would be totally against it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments, Mr. Milia. Is there another uh, member of the public online that would like to speak? Ms. Hill? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it looks like uh, Rupert Kindersley uh, was trying to unmute themselves and turn on their camera. If they would uh, like to speak next, you'd be welcome to. Please. No, no, sorry, that was, uh, I, didn't, I don't need to speak. Thank you. Okay, anybody else online that would like to speak? Okay, hearing none, could the township's planner, Emily Hill, please summarize any additional correspondence that has been submitted on these proposals uh, for the application and provide any further information? Uh, thank you, Chair. I do apologize. It looks like Ms. Uh, Kulitz has raised her hand again if uh, she has any additional comments or questions. Ms. Coolis. Uh, again, Linda Coolis, three two one two Fairgrounds. Um, uh, I I know I was offline for a bit because the power went out a few times, but I actually don't see anybody that's come forward that is pro uh, tree um, permit plan that's spoken today. Everybody sounds like they're against it. I just want to make note of that. I don't know anybody that's pro plan. Uh, to have to get a permit to cut trees on your own property. Correct. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Coolis. Uh, back to you, Ms. Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll actually defer to the Township's consultant, Jamie Robinson, who will provide a summary. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robinson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just before we move on, what I think would be appropriate, I don't usually do this, but given the feedback we've heard tonight or this morning, I think I'd just like to summary, summarize in general terms the comments that we've heard today and sort of the areas of those comments. Member Cox? <clears throat> Did we bring forward the other ones that were sent out? Sorry, Seal? thank you, Chair. Um, I can provide um, that. Um, so we did receive additional written correspondence from Stephen Leanne Lovering, Jacob Dobb from East Shore Road, the Tea Lake Property Owners Association, and Tyler Boswell. Those were the comments that were circulated to uh, members of committee following the publishing the of the agenda. Um, I know Mr. Robinson will provide an overview of all the comments received, um, but the comments that were circulated included those both for and in opposition to the proposed bylaw. Thank you. So what I'd just like to summarize for for the committee members and everyone here today is I think generally what we've heard is um, is that there's some concerns with the scope of the bylaw as it's been 
been drafted, uh, particularly the, for the most part that it's overstated in many instances. Uh, we've heard comments, we've heard no comments in support of the proposed bylaw outside of shoreline areas. Um, we've heard support for um, for the proposed bylaw in shoreline areas, but with limited scope. With a limited scope, we've heard some comments about reducing the area to something like 30 meters or 20 meters. Those were some suggestions that were provided. We heard some suggestions about ensuring that there was some sort of parameter set around density of vegetation or percentage of vegetation so that some limited vegetation removal can occur as of right within those uh, within those shoreline areas. But the real focus is about clear cutting and preventing those clear cutting scenarios. We heard some comments about fire smart and making sure that there's some reference to that in the bylaw and that that uh, folks aren't prohibited from move, removing vegetation around their cottage properties that could uh, cause impacts from a wildland fire um, perspective. We heard some comments about uh, about the process that the permitting process needs to be outlined before anything comes back to council if the bylaw is to come back to council. And we heard some concerns about the implementation costs. And I think a lot of those related to implementation costs of, uh, relate to the sco overall scope of the bylaw. So I just wanted to reiterate before we hear from council, like those are the comments that I think we've heard generally loud and clear. And, and there were some other ones, but uh, I just thought maybe it'll scope our discussion going further from council if I summarized exactly what we've heard from the public so far. So. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Do any members of the committee have questions? Uh, Mr. Brennan, or Member Brennan? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes. I've got a few things I wanna to add to the conversation that I think will be of value to people that are interested. First of all, I wanna thank everybody for their input. It's fantastic to have this kind of input. It's nice to see democracy at work in its healthiest forms. So thank you for that, some good comments. My interest around a tree cutting bylaw would relate to the protection of waterways and lakes. I don't care if you cut down all the trees on your property and in, 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 in a town or settlement area, I really could care less about that. That's you and your neighbor's fight, not mine. So the tree cutting bylaw, a tree cutting bylaw would help us big time in terms of protecting shorelands. Uh, and it works best with the site alteration bylaw that was previously discussed. Usually they're paired more than ever now. Permanent housing is being built on shorelands uh, um, and OPs and bylaws may say the right things, but they're easily bypassed by uh, non-conforming provisions. We need to consider the cumulative impacts and demand on net environmental gains and shoreline changes. I wanna make a note that um, there are studies that demonstrate that the removal of natural vegetation from shorelands has become a harmful and growing trend all across Canada and Ontario is no exemption and is a major factor in the decline of water quality and wildlife communities. I would like to refer you to some uh, work done by the uh, Watersheds Canada, a, a very respected group that has done some work around the science of vegetated buffers. And this is sort of interesting stuff. This study was supported by conservation authorities, Friends of Tay, Tay Watership Association, and the Federation of Ontario Cottage Associations. So they talk about the shorelines and, and the shorelands, and I won't get into all the needs, but in essence, they're pretty essential in terms of protecting the environmental quality on your lakes. So let me go. We did talk historically, we spoke today about shore lines, but new science says that we should be using the term shore lands and encompass the full set of ecosystems that are affected. So there's four, four zones that are critical to protecting your water quality on your lakes. The first one is an upland zone. That's an elevated area, it's a well-drained area outside of the flood zone. And it is the source, basically, of most land-based pollutants on, uh, on the property and on vegetation and organic uh, removal as well. 
So that's that sort of upper layer from, say, your cottage. Then there's the riparian zone you may be more familiar with. So that ex extends from the shoreline about 15 meters in on average. It's composed generally of tolerant, moisture tolerant vegetation. Scientists suggest that up to 70% of terrestrial wildlife globally rely on this zone for some point of their existence. It also plays a fundamental role in preventing pollution from entering a fresh waterway through the interception of runoff and associated pollutants. The shoreline is your next zone. It's critical for erosion control. And finally, the fourth zone is the, the littoral zone, which is an aquatic zone that extends from the high water mark of your properties to a point where light doesn't penetrate to the bottom of the water. It is important for aquatic species protecting water quality, and, and it serves as a nitrogen sink, and it recycles nutrients. So that's why they talk now, not about old bylaws where you talk about a shoreline, they talk about shorelands, because that's today's science. Now, holding back the pollutants, uh, failure to hold back the pollutants, and um, there are people in this room I know that have this experience, can lead to algae blooms that result in eutrophication and are a health concern, not only to you, but to your pets. It, since 2013, water quality has been ranked the most value lake-related characteristic by over 85% of Ontario shoreland property owners. However, only 22% of those properties surveyed met minimum standards for addressing the health of the lake. Ontario has been monitoring blue-green algae since 1994, then the occurrences have drastically uh, increased because of nutrient loading and higher average temperatures. And the chart is disturbing. I can give it to anyone who wants to see it. It goes like this. All right. So how wide a buffer is enough? We've heard 60. We've heard this. We've heard that. Well. There is some science to that can be discussed around the generation of this, okay? Buffers in the range of 20 to 30 meters have exhibited rates of nutrient and pollution abatement between 80 and 90%. That's pretty good. Now, it very much depends on the organic the site, and of course, slope affects these things. The Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks Lakeshore Assessment Handbook, a 2020 document that is based on scientific studies, overwhelmingly supports buffer width of 30 plus meters to provide effective mitigation and protect aquatic resources. So I'm not sure where the 60 meter figure came from, but I think it, it's pretty fair that an argument can be made for 30 or 40 meter setbacks. So that's something that'll have to be decided. And, and there may be a rationale for the 60 meter. I haven't come across it in any reviews I've done but perhaps uh, 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 Jamie would be able to explain that. Also, some scientists say that up to 100 meter are necessary to protect certain species of reptile birds and aquatic invertebrates. But I think generally speaking, um, you know, this sort of buffer widths, uh, buffer widths exceeding 30 meters are typically difficult on most private and commercial properties that, that you know, I think we're hearing that today. So. Let's talk for a second about uh, invasive species. High populations of invasive species, which means greater than 24% in front of your properties. Some of you are dealing with Phragmites. There's about 17 other invasive plants that are causing lots of grief to cottage people these days. Uh, these invasive species are not as beneficial to native wildlife species for either food or habitat. So. What you don't want is to be ruining that front aquatic zone that I mentioned by having lawn right down to the water surface. Lawns do not have the root system to control erosion like trees and natural vegetation and shrubs. Okay? Climate change. We have less ice, reduced levels of dissolved oxygen in your water in your lakes. Reduced oxygen. The same problem you have in Lake Simcoe. That's why the fish are having a problem. Spawning gets interrupted. So 
you know, to say that we aren't, this is not your mom and dad's day in terms of cottage ownership. These are different times. Our challenges are much greater and there's science to prove it. So, so I think we need to do away with just having a tree. I mean, I, you have to acknowledge here, you need more than a tree cutting bylaw and a site alteration bylaw. We need to educate neighbors. We need to work with people. We need programs like SIA promotes in terms of invasive species control. There's a whole lot of things we need, but we know this. The people who own these properties based on study value the quality of the water more than anything. And to me, that's why we would do this. I don't really care about aesthetics. Now, I was asked by a fellow councillor to review an alternate bylaw that is in existence uh, with the township of, North, of uh, Georgian Bay. And I want to tell you that I did, as I was asked, and I want to just give you some results of that. So I had a fabulous, fabulous conversation uh, and a lengthy one with the senior municipal law enforcement officer that deals with that bylaw. Their bylaw has no licenses, permits, or fees required, and it also, as Jamie has suggested, grants exemptions. Uh, it primarily deals with the first 20 meters from the shore, and it's a complaint-driven process, um, including, you know, like I said, there's exemptions for removal of dead, disease, hazardous trees. I asked the bylaw officer, how do you do that? You know, I, you phone and say, my neighbor, I can't stand that person, so I'm going to complain that he cut down a tree. And I said, so how do you deal with that? And, and, and it's interesting because the real truth of it is, if a bylaw officer shows up and you cut down a tree and you say, the tree was diseased. Well, what they ask you to do there is they ask you to send in a picture. And a picture is worth a thousand words. Anyone who knows even basic things about trees knows that a fruiting body is pretty disastrous. You know, if you get one of those hoof-shaped fruit, fruiting bodies on the tree on your property, you got four to eight feet of rot above and below that point. That tree is in serious trouble. You got a tree with a dead top, that tree is in serious trouble. You don't need to be an arborist or a forester for some of these things. All of these things, are, you got a V-shaped notch in a pine beside your house, high threat to damaging your roof. These are no brain, you know, things. So in essence, that, that's how they, they uh, they're complaint driven. That's how they deal with it. And uh, what they look for mostly is things like, say multiple stumps exist on the property right by the water. You go up, okay, really? Were all those trees bad? You know what I mean? So it gets into situations like that. They're pretty liberal. They, he says this, that this thing works pretty good even without a permit system. So uh, they also permit things like viewscape allowances. 25% of the tree is distributed through the short, what they call the shoreline vegetative buffer, right? Can be removed. And I know our bylaw currently has drafted in terms of pruning says you can prune up to 10%. I would argue, and there may be an arborist out there, maybe things have changed since my days in the field, but I would argue that you could easily prune 20% of most trees and not do any harm to that tree and create a viewscape for people. And viewscapes are nice. If I got a nice cottage, I want to see the lake, you know. I, I don't want to see a floating cottage, but I want to see the lake. So let's talk about exemptions. I called a man who writes, a friend of mine, who writes uh, prescriptions under the Ontario Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program. And I asked him, would something like this need to be involved in a tree cutting bylaw or would it be an exemption? Now, just for those of you who don't know, because if you don't, you should, I'm gonna sell this program to you. You need 9.8 acres to get a managed forest tax reduction. And basically you commit to doing a fairly decent job of managing your forest. With high taxes these days, if you have that, man, you'd be crazy not to take advantage of that program. So you need 10.8 acres to do it because you need an acre for your property and allowable buildings. These plans would be exempt, in my mind, from anything like that. Now, these plans require, if there is going to be harvesting on a property, they do require that an, a registered professional forester do the cutting, uh, prescribe the cutting plan. It doesn't mean they cut it. <clears throat> it means they, they have a prescription in there. And uh, so that's covered. You have a professional who is accountable writing up those things. And just to mention clear cuts, it's interesting. I keep hearing of all my life, I've heard about clear cuts being bad. I just, 
just for a second here, there are times when you might have to clear cut an area, whether it's on the lake or not. I'll give you, well, right now we're dealing hugely with, with uh, ash borer problems. They're cutting ash trees left, right, and center in the parks in, in Aurelia right now. You have scotch pine on your property that's infected with Dipodia pinia. You have a major fire hazard. You're going to have to get rid of all those trees. They're going to have to be cut down. They're going to have to be removed or burned. Sometimes that's what you got to do. And then, of course, presumably you'd replace it. So fire smart, fire smart programs surely should be again. Well, again. Now, just, just another minute. I'm going to wrap up here. So one problem with the current bylaw in, the, in Georgia and Township is that it is that linear line. It doesn't deal with the four zones I'm talking about. We've moved way beyond that. It's a 2014 bylaw, and I'm told they're planning to update it. And it's interesting. As we speak, one of the updates involves them uh, bringing in a, uh, what, uh, what do they call this? It's a, a failure to comply provision. So is that when they do want to do enforcement on the bylaw, because what will happen if they do catch someone that's being a bad boy, then they basically will issue a stop work order and you will need to fix the problem. They'll issue a, a repair order. And if you don't do that, they're having this failure to comply provision added in so that they get a little more warmth to getting things done. So that's one. And the other thing, of course, is the bylaws, their bylaws 10 years, is 10 years old. And like our site alteration bylaw should be updated to include the modern terminologies and requirements. That's my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brennan. Uh, Member Minnins. Hi, thank you. Um, just a few comments from me. It's interesting how um, I keep hearing, and this is over the last month or so, that the terms tree cutting bylaw and tree conservation bylaw seem to be used interchangeably. And so just a point that they're not the same thing and um, it is a tree conservation bylaw. I'm another comment. I don't believe that clear cutting on shorelines is a new trend at all. Um, the property that I live on that we purchased six years ago was clear cut at some point previously. There are lots of, um, not lots, there are other properties that are tree uh, clear cut and it's a real shame that that happens. But um, like the property that was described at Gloucester's Pool that was clear cut, um, not only is that alarming and disturbing, it's unfortunate. And I'm struggling with understanding how at this committee, planning and development over the last year that I've sat on council, that I have heard and there have been presentations come forward to us um, about requirements of property owners, new builds, renovations, whatever, anything happening on a property where remediation is required. And that's on a property by property basis as the township becomes aware of it. So I'm just wondering if, again, if this bylaw is not way overarching as so many people have said and is um, not really treating the problem at its source, but trying to um, just cover all things. It can't be all things to all people. So I, I would like to see what the township can do and to um, make sure that mediation, remediation is um, does happen to protect properties, et cetera. My other, my last comment is, I am concerned that developers are exempt and I, you know, I'm in West Shore, Ward 4, lots of development, and I'm not against development. I'm about the blend, right? The old and the new has to work together. Decisions are made decades ago, and that's all fine. Um, I get it why people want to live up here, and I think that's fantastic. But does the bylaw, if there is a bylaw that ends up at the end of this, really protect trees, or is it protecting development? And I will speak specifically to one property that um, the residents brought to my attention a year ago. And I had one of our members of council come to meet a bunch of property owners. There was about 50 or 60 of them that showed up that day. 
and it is a property owned by a developer that will be a waterfront access to the new development that's going in because if somebody's going to be buying a new house um, near water they want to be able to use the water not just see it and that's important that people have access to water but this particular water access property that won't have a house built on it it's fully wooded lots of big trees i'm not a tree expert um but they all have numbered silver tags attached to them and i've brought that forward so it's been a concern it's sort of sitting out there um the tags are still on the trees it's not my property but i can see the tags um we all can so what are we really doing? And are we being a little bit, um, what problem are we really solving when we're talking about water and quality, et cetera? So if it's not a problem, I don't want to see a bylaw is what I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Member Minnings. Okay, Member Taylor. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh uh, I'm one of the family names mentioned by Mr. Gladall that for over 100 years we've taken firewood out and managed a sugar bush without a, a tree cutting bylaw. And this proposed bylaw is overreaching. It's a result of extensive removal of a tree lines, trees from a shoreline on residential property. So that's where it started. And I've got a couple of issues here and then I've got a couple of scenarios. So I question the 60 meters from a navigable waterway. I question the, the time frame. You can't do anything from April 1 to September 30th. Uh, and these things that when it says may be required, a site plan may be required. Well, that's a big deal. A site plan is a big deal. Uh, an arborist may be required because I have here an exemption, removal of diseased trees which have been approved by an arborist report or approved by an officer. So I'm not sure if that's required. Um, so I'm saying that once again, may a tree production plan may be required. And this means uh, completed by an arborist or a qualified professional. There may be a hydro tree report required. These are all big things may, and it may require a, a tree protection plan, uh, which involves soil compaction inside the tree protection zones. And it also says uh, with a tree production plan, hand-drawn sketches will not be accepted. And some of the, the offenses and the fines come out uh, started at a thousand dollars. So that's it's crazy. So a couple of questions here. So I looked at the map and I questioned navigable waterway. And it says here, uh, any body of water that is capable of affording reasonable passage of watercraft of any description. So my question is, could a municipal drain be classified? I see Perbert Creek is, but what about the Coatter Madonte drain? What about Rice Creek Municipal Drain? Could a beaver pond, pond be classified? And I'm seeing on the map, some beaver ponds are, some aren't. Like, I think it's crazy. So I have a scenario for Mr. Robinson, if he can answer it. So my property is zone GL. I planted 15 spruce trees there 30 years ago. Four trees were destroyed by the gypsy moth three years ago. All the green needles were removed. The trees have been dead for three years. The trees are 20 to 50 meters from the Machadash River. Can you outline the, the steps required for me to take down these dead trees? Mr. Robinson? So let me, I think I got this right, but you're saying trees are within the Greenlands designation. They're within 60 meters of the river, so therefore, they're encompassed in that area that was be covered in brown effectively on those schedules. So it's covered off by the bylaw. So you want to know what needs to be completed in order to remove those trees. Are they healthy trees? Well, I say uh, of out of 15, four of them are dead. Okay. With gypsy moth. So the dead ones you can take down. No so, issues. So an arborist is required? Yes or no? No. A site plan required? No. A tree prediction plan required? No. Hands drawn sketch required? You don't have to do anything. You can just so take them down. What if the trees aren't diseased? And I, there's 15 I planted. I want to take four down. Of the healthy ones? They're healthy. Yeah. So if, if they're healthy trees, then 
that's the piece that we haven't confirmed what the permitting process would be to do that or if you need a permitting permit to do that but you would not for example you will not need any of those studies that you identified to to undertake that you need to provide some justification on why they need why they need to come down or not and i think what it would likely entail is is there existing other vegetation in the area? Is it going to impact the environment, for example? And if the answers to all that are no, then I think you may, if it's determined that there is a permitting process in place, then you need a permit. If we decide that the bylaw is, if the bylaw gets passed and there's no need for permitting, just like what Councillor Brennan talked about in Georgian Bay, then you can proceed to take down those trees. Hey, thank you. I have a second scenario. Uh, someone makes a complaint to the township. Uh, they report that there's evidence of trees removed from a shoreline property zoned SR2. What action does or will the township take? And can fees be assessed? So I think to make sure I'm clear on this, somebody calls the municipality, says neighboring property next to me has had some trees removed. I think it's in contravention of the tree cutting bylaw. They would have to make right. that statement. So that would be the same process as any other municipal bylaw. So for that specific instance, if they said there's been tree removed, trees removed, I've reviewed the bylaw, I believe it's in contravention, the bylaw officer would, would follow up, attend the site, and have to make a determination on whether they've contravened the bylaw or not. And if they did, then based on the penalties that are outlined in the bylaw, there would be uh, that person that removed those trees would either be not in contravention of the bylaw if deemed appropriate by the bylaw officer or deemed in contravention of the bylaw. And then they'd be subject to those penalties that are outlined. But in summary then, in summary then they, uh, the bylaw officer would come on private property and to investigate. Yes, if they felt there was an infraction to the bylaw, yes, that's correct. Okay, and just in summary, uh, this bylaw proposed is way overreach, overkill, and, and it shouldn't go forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Cox. Yeah, um, first of all, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, through the chair to, I think, would be Andrea. Andrea, the county forester um, does will come in, will they come in, I think they do, to private properties to help them with their forest management? Uh, if I may, through you, Mr. Chair, to Member Cox, it is my understanding that they do. Unfortunately, I don't know the details of the process that would be involved, but I understand at a high level they do. Okay, I just thought that there were some people who had talked about having forests and if they can go in and help them. They helped us up on the Reservoir Hill. They came and marked and what would go and what wouldn't go. My concern too is um, <clears throat> at this time the clear cutting on properties without or that are not in subdivision development is controlled by site plan or permitted license by Simcoe County Forestry Department and we haven't had a huge problem with it. We live in a rural area and 90% or more property owners enjoy looking after their woodlots, their trees and they protect them. We don't need this bylaw right now. There are many layers of enforcement, permits, site visits, etc. staff time and at a cost to the taxpayer. One day this bylaw might be needed and council at the time can bring it forward if there is a need for it. I'm really pleased that so many people came out today and spoke to this. This is why we have public meetings and draft bylaws and for everyone can have their input. The other one I was concerned about in, with this um, is neighbor conflict. I, I think that when you cut down a tree, neighbors go, why'd you cut three down? And they call somebody. It's happened to a lot of people. Um, I want to speak to what uh, Member Brennan said. I would say that the majority of the shorelands are already the, is it front aquatic zone, are already destroyed. I'm sorry, but they are. And if anything happens, the big major problem would be um, replanting of native species, remediation, and the Severn Sound Environmental Association is there to help us do that. I know that they have planted things on the Coldwater River to help the bank stay stable. I know that other cottagers and people have called them to plant. 
I know dog is one. I'm not sure of all the other ones, but that is part of what they do for us. And that is why we're really happy to have that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Burkett. Thank you through the chair. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, I'm going to say something. You're going to caution me whether I can or not. And committee, I'm sorry, I'm going to say something as well. We're going to put us all on the spot, but uh, Madam Clerk is going to caution me. I know that we can't make any decisions today, no decisions whatsoever. And we have a public meeting tonight that we need to listen to what our residents have to say as well. What I'm going to say, and Mr. Robinson, I want to thank you for your presentation. Well done. And for everyone to understand that we as a council, when we do get a complaint from a resident, we need to act on it. So as a council, we direct staff to do what it takes to bring back a report. Hence, we have Mr. Robinson and his group coming back with a thorough report. But at this time, Madam Clerk, if this committee, and I know that Mr. Robinson has some more work to bring back to council before we actually make a decision, can we as a committee take a vote to not have Mr. Robinson come back with that report and we just leave it the way it is? We just put the report, put it on a shelf so that no more fees are incurred and Mr. Robinson is a resident of this township? So the residents of this township do not incur any more costs because what I'm hearing and what I've heard so far, and I'm sure what I'm going to hear tonight, it's going to be echoed what was said here today. So I look to you, Madam Clerk, for direction. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the record, I support that. Thank you. Um, so we do have an open house tonight. I want to make that clear. It's not another public meeting. It is just an open house um, to receive further input. Um, council can, well, we have a public meeting or an open house scheduled for tonight. It is completely within council's purview to do what they wish. Um, council, I would suggest, may not want to completely close it until you have that open house this evening because people are attending in good faith. Um, that their input will be received. Um, however, um, we can wordsmith a motion that gives clear indication the council leaning a certain direction, conditional upon that feedback being received. Um, staff will need to report back to close this off um, for council, for the public, and so everyone. So we have a final resolution as to how the matter has been addressed. Um, so we can smith a motion so that it gives clear indication as to where council's leaning um pending and conditional upon that final report and public input being received okay thank you member cox through the chair to the clerk this isn't council this is a committee and we make recommendations to council the council meeting isn't for two or three weeks so even if we make what we make it can it doesn't really do anything until council ratifies it on the april whatever the first Wednesday of April is, and that will be when the, the real decision would be made. So bottom line is, is the information that people will give tonight still will be for us to be able to talk about or look at as a council on that date. Uh, thank you. I uh, just didn't follow up to uh, member Cox's comment. Um, I generally don't know if staff have time after tonight's open house to spin that fast enough to get the final report on council to come with what would be, and you are correct, a recommendation from committee to council. Um, just because the way our agenda cycle works is that we're working already a week and a half to two weeks in advance. So essentially the report that would have to go on council technically would be due tomorrow. Um, so it doesn't give staff time to actually process everything. Now that said, council can completely just pull the motion from the committee minutes and have a further discussion at that time. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to put that and say, I don't know if it's realistic to expect staff to report that quickly back straight to council in April. Supplemental. I didn't mean to report. I meant the fact that we can pull it and we can do what we want at the council meeting. Here we don't have, we can't do, we can re we can recommend as a committee, but it's council that ratifies it in April, right? So that would give us a chance to pull it. And then if we didn't want to have it, we could make that decision 
point of this. What? I just in the first week yeah. at our council meeting. Yes. Is there something else? No. Okay. okay. Did you have a, re a response, Madam Clerk? Uh, I just, uh, in anticipation of where council may go on this, staff came prepared. But before we get to that, I know that Member Minnings wanted to speak. Member Minnings? Thank you. Um, I don't know. Right now, I need some help understanding what the urgency is to stop this today or, or in three weeks at council because. My thinking is that we've had all of this great feedback. I've taken notes, but I haven't noted everything. And I know, um, Jamie, that you did, and that's what your work and your team is doing for us, is capturing all of that feedback. So I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm, I would probably bet money on where this is going. However, I would like to see that the investment we've put into it in, in engaging um, your office and getting all of this feedback everyone's time that we should get your final report we should allow the process to end with a final report of what that even that pared down version would be and like other reports in the recommendation section of what comes to council with a report attached is the recommendation of this should go forward or this shouldn't go forward or whatever that recommendation is. But I think just to finish that and to not lose um, the feedback, um, I wouldn't want to see that right now at this point. And I don't know if it's urgent that we need to um, stop the bylaw in three weeks or whenever. And I know the clerks mentioned she wouldn't, there wouldn't be enough time to get it on the next agenda, but without anything really changing for residents, et cetera, I would like to see that captured because, you know, in three, less than three years from now, there's gonna be a new team sitting at this table and I really don't wanna see things cycle back or have to jump on a YouTube video and listen back to three hours to get make my own notes again. I like to have things sort of the I's dotted, the T's crossed. I think we'll come to the same result, but I, I just not sure if I'm missing the urgency. Um, I'd like to see it end um, as it's intended to. That's my comment. Thank Member you. Burkett. Thank you through the chair. So that wasn't uh, what I was looking for. What I, where I was going, and I'll just wait. So, and it's not personal, Mr. Robinson, Jamie. It isn't. No, I'm just curious, just for the benefit of council, what I'm, what, because there was a lot of good discussion today, but there's still a lot of work for you to do to bring back a report for council. So, what I've heard today and what I've heard from the, from residents, and I know what I'm going to hear tonight because my place of business is like a, whatever you'd like to call it. I've already heard many, many responses. How much more work is involved so that we can save your time because you're busy as well because there are questions to member minning's comments that you're going to come back with a wholesome report and i'm sorry to put you on the spot how much more work is involved or do we even know that before you bring back a report that's not going to be approved as far as i know by this council madam i'm, CA, I'm guessing madam ceo Thank you. I wonder if the balance for what I'm hearing from one end to the other end is that we, I think Allison's got a motion that's to this, but instead of a, a full blown final report, it's just a scaled down to say, you know, this is what we heard at the public meeting. Does council want to proceed? Yes or no. And that wraps it up. It doesn't make a lot more work of, for Jamie, but uh, it, it, it demonstrates to the public that you followed the process. Okay, thank you. And if I may, I, I do, uh, Jean, uh, Mr. Robinson, I appreciate the report that you put forward. I also appreciate the uh, amount of public comments that have come forward, not only today, but uh, uh, by email or by phone. Uh, people have really spoken out uh, um, uh, about uh, their feelings and uh, presented it in a reasonable way to uh, this committee. Thank you for that. Um, Madam Clerk, do we, uh, do I, uh, I'll read them at my remarks first, I guess. Yes. Uh, so please re be reminded that uh, a decision will not be made today on the draft bylaws. Following this meeting, the information obtained, including questions and comments 
submitted by members of the public and committee will assist the township and its consultants to report back to the planning and development committee at a future date to determine next steps. A reminder that there is an in-person open house this evening starting at 6 p.m. in the council chambers as an additional opportunity to provide comments and ask questions. Madam Clerk, could we have that draft motion? Certainly. So this is a pretty slightly changed motion from the version that was in your staff report that's included in your agenda. Um, so it's the planning report number P24-010 dated March 20th, 2024 with respect to updating the township's site alteration and fill bylaw 2011-23 as amended together with a new site specific tree conservation bylaw be received. And further that the township's consultant asthma be directed to report back with any suggested modifications to the fill bylaw in accordance with the comments provided at the public meeting and open house as appropriate. And further that staff and the township's consultants MHBC report back regarding the proposed tree conservation bylaw that the bylaw not proceed conditional upon a review of the comments provided at the public meeting and open house. Okay, thank you. Could I get a mover and a seconder? Uh, okay, uh, Ms. Member Minnings. Sorry, I just need a point of clarification. For the scope of the work that we've entered into with uh, Mr. Robinson's company, does that actually complete the scope of the work doing the final report? So there's no disadvantage. Thank you. Okay. Um, you'd like to speak, uh, Member Burkett and Member Brennan? Thank you, through you, through the Chair. I just want to say that uh, I know there was no vote taking place today, but Member McIntyre did meet with me beforehand, and he did stress that he wanted it uh, to be said at the floor that he is not in favor of the tree bylaw. Okay. Thank you, Member Brennan. I just want to some clarity on the motion. So the motion would mean that no um, recommendations would come out based on the input. I'm, I'm trying to understand what exactly would be delivered in a report. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the intent that I'm gaining consensus from, from council is that there is general concurrence that council does not want to investigate uh, further modifications to the bylaw, it would just come back with the public comments and review of what has been said, and then council would vote a final uh, yay or nay, but um, through this would be indicating a nay in the future um, on the bylaw. Member Taylor? Like a recorded vote, please. Okay. Would... Uh... Yep. Uh, would there uh, uh, would the members of the committee like the motion to be read again? Okay, Madam Clerk. Okay, so just uh, for one more time, um, first clause is just that the report itself be received. Second is that the staff uh, be directed with Azimuth to report back with any suggested modifications to the fill bylaw in accordance with the comments provided at the public meeting and open house as appropriate. And further, that staff and the township's consultants MHBC report back regarding the proposed tree conservation bylaw that the that the bylaw not proceed conditional upon a review of the comments provided at the public meeting and open house. So it gives indication that of how council is going to proceed, but still have that public final report come back. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Could I have a mover and seconder? Uh, Member Cox, Member Minnings. I believe a recorded vote was requested. Okay, Madam Clerk. Recorded vote was requested by Member Taylor. Member Taylor for or against? Yes. Okay. Uh, Member Jansen for or against? Hey, if I can get you to use your microphone, that would be great for those listening. Yes. Thank you. Um, Member Cox for or against? Yes. Uh, Member Brennan for or against? Against. Okay, Member Burkett, for or against? Four. Uh, Member Minnings, for or against? Four. Okay, motion's carried. <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. And if I may request that we just take a five minute stretch break before we get into our delegation okay. um, that has been very patiently waiting through all this, that would be great. Okay, we will take a five minute uh, break and we'll return.
Okay, thank you. We'll now carry on with the rest of our agenda. Moving on to item D, delegations. Please be advised that in accordance with council's procedural bylaw, no decision will be made today on the delegations. The committee will do one of the following. A, refer the matter to a staff for a report. B, take the matter to further budget deliberations. Or C, take no action. So the first on the agenda, D.1, Sarah Beasley, Clark Little, TC Energy, RE Pump Storage Project. Hello, test, test. How's the audio? We can hear you just fine. Yep, please go ahead. Excellent, thank you. Um, I believe uh, TC Energy has provided uh, some, a slide deck uh, to the council um, in advance. Um, I'll refer that um, as needed during questions, um, but I have some prepared remarks. So uh, if council just wants to uh, put up uh, like the, the first slide, um, you know, for uh, people to look at, that's fine. And I'll be, I'll begin my remarks now. So uh, your worship and uh, members of council, uh, on behalf of TC Energy, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to address you uh, the, uh, this morning or this afternoon rather. I am uh, Herb Shields. I'm a team lead for external relations at TC Energy and I'm based out of Meaford, Ontario. I am a farm boy from Northern Ontario a voting member of the Algonquins of Ontario, a graduate of the University of Waterloo, an accredited public relations professional in Canada, and I've been developing and constructing energy facilities in Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and Alberta for 17 years. The Ontario Pump Storage Project and Partnership is without a doubt the most important and compelling concept I've ever had the privilege to work on. It simultaneously represents a significant climate change initiative a concrete step toward a net zero electrical system in Ontario, an important and meaningful step in our journey towards Indigenous reconciliation, and an opportunity to develop local energy solution that creates jobs and economic stimulation here in Ontario, especially Simcoe County. The rationale for this project continues to get stronger and stronger every year. Ontario's population grew by 450,000 people last year, and that number is expected to continue to grow. That's like adding a slightly less than the population of Simcoe County every year to the province. At the same time, as Ontario is growing, it's electrifying. Electric vehicles, heat pumps, transit, clean steel making, and new investments by companies like Stellantis, Volkswagen, Honda in Simcoe County, Magna in Simcoe County, are all adding to the provincial demand. The government of Ontario has confirmed in less than 30 years, Ontario could need more than double the electricity generating capacity it has now. That's every hydro dam, wind farm, solar farm, nuclear power plant staying at their current capabilities and then replicating it at least once over. The price estimate for that by the government of Ontario's own estimates is around $400 billion. The government of Canada is prioritizing efforts to combat climate change with the goal of achieving a net zero electricity grid by 2035. That will require Ontario to eventually close its gas fire generation and replace it with clean electricity. To put that in perspective, that's 9,000 megawatts. That's roughly four Niagara Falls' worth of power of natural gas will be need to be replaced with zero emissions power in roughly a decade. Combined, these forces will drive an extraordinary and rapid evolution of our power grid by 2050. We cannot and will not get to net zero without massive amounts of energy storage. At its heart, this project is a climate change initiative, a clean energy initiative that will assist with an orderly transition away from Ontario's reliance on costly fossil fuel generation. Not only is this a climate change project, but it also represents one of the largest indigenous reconciliation initiatives currently underway in Canada. If this project moves forward, it will only go move, move forward in partnership with the Saugeen and Ojibwe Nation. We have made a commitment that we need their support and their support is through partnership. This facility becomes as much a Saugeen and Ojibwe Nation asset as it does ours. Our prospective partners will have a significant equity ownership, an active role in management, environmental stewardship, and other activities. 
We've made commitments to ensuring they have employment, training, contracting, and supplying of the project, including wraparound services and training that they have specifically requested. Through their own investments of their own capital, the project would earn them a stable long-term source of revenue that would have significant impacts on improving services, infrastructure, and quality of life within their nations. I want to stress from day one, co-ownership and co-management between industry and Indigenous partner is a first for me. This project will be a source of pride and a key to their economic self-determination. In the words of Ogimab Greg Najawan, this investment has the potential to change Saugeen Ojibwe Nation from managing poverty to managing prosperity. And it provides an excellent opportunity for you to advance Indigenous reconciliation with your Anishinaabe neighbors. Let me make this clear. The Saugeen Ojibwe Nation will not allow this project to move forward if we cannot demonstrate that we are protecting Georgian Bay. That's why they have had a leading role in the design of this project. That's why for the past several years, they've been doing their own independent environmental assessment, which includes discussions with Saugeen and Nawash fishers, whose livelihood depends on the health of the bay. They know the bay better than anyone else, and they are making decisions on this project based on facts. I should also add, as part of our feasibility and conceptual stage of this project, we have been doing outreach and engagement with over 40 Indigenous nations and groups and communities, including the Chippewa Tri-Council. This project has not yet even begun a federal provincial impact assessment process, and we expect that to begin in the latter half of 2024. There are some, including Laura Kindersley and former Farmington, Michigan mayor and seasonal resident Tom Buck that have uh, raised concerns about this project. They will point in their presentation to Ludington Pump Storage Project in Ludington, Michigan as a bad example of hydro pump storage, but there are important facts to keep in mind. First, while the function and role of our proposed Meaford uh, facility is similar to Lunnington, the design of our project could not be more different. Federal Canadian officials, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, and TC Energy have visited Lunnington to learn from their experience. As a, as a direct result of our review of Lunnington, and more importantly, the feedback that we received from cottagers, the public, Indigenous nations, and individuals like Mr. Buck, we completely redesigned this project in 2021. Unlike Ludington, all major facilities in our design are effectively placed underground or underwater, and our inlet outlet system, the system that actually interacts with Georgian Bay, is designed to protect fish and fish habitat and the quality of water in Georgian Bay. We have listened and made significant changes based on what we heard including regional and national NGOs, and as I've mentioned, Indigenous nations. Changes that have added cost to this facility, but that we deemed were essential to demonstrate the sincerity of our efforts to address concerns that we've already heard. Secondly, Ludington performs a very important function in the electricity system in Michigan, and that is a critical resource in balancing Michigan's electricity system, especially important in integrating renewable power to Michigan and is a planning and Michigan is planning to add to that. And after a multi-year assessment by the Federal Regulatory Commission in the United States, it was relicensed in 2019 for a further 50 years. I should also add the Department of Energy in the United States and the state of Michigan in January and February of this year have indicated they will support the restart of the Palisades nuclear station in Michigan as a direct result of this growing demand for clean energy across North America. We recently had a conversation with Ludington's mayor, Mark Barnett, who expressed how the facility's tax revenues and spending has helped Ludington keep their schools and roads and services open and well-maintained. He also noted that Ludington's robust seasonal tourism and recreational boating and fishing industries on Lake Michigan have been supported by the facility through their scenic outlooks and trails, the Development of Fisheries Trust that supports their thriving fishing community, and by the facility's employees who bring their families and friends to Ludington for vacations. I would encourage you to reach out to Mayor Barnett to hear this for yourself. When it comes to long duration energy storage at scale, pumped hydro storage is the optimal solution for Ontario. The cost and environmental footprint to replicate it 
using chemical batteries such as lithium ion would be significantly higher when the overall life cycle impact is considered, including mining, manufacturing, transportation, installation, replacement, and disposal. I would encourage uh, you to reach out to Magna, to Honda Canada, and to Simcoe County Economic Development Office, who keeps track of manufacturing in Simcoe County, and ask those manufacturers how they are securing a supply chain in an ever more insecure world. Ratepayers are concerned about costs and ratepayer value. We share that concern. We also know the Independent Electricity Operator, the Ontario Energy Board, and the Minister of Energy also share these concerns deeply. This is why the Minister of Energy wrote to the Independent Electricity Operator in January 9th of this year regarding this project and provided direction to seek clarification on that value. The Minister of Energy has made it clear, similar to hydro dams and nuclear power stations, this project, like any other, must benefit all Ontarians. Like any other project, we need to make sure this project provides an overall economic benefit to Ontario before it moves forward. And the process outlined is prudent and appropriate to inform a final decision on advancing it. We continue to work with the Ministry of Energy and the Ontario Energy Board to establish a long-term commercial framework. We expect that that project will be rate regulated, which ensures that the project provides Ontario residents and businesses with cost prudency, transparency, flexibility, and the lowest possible cost. Under this well-established model, the risk and cost to going to market to assume debt and arrange a viable financial model to build and operate this facility will be the responsibility of the proponents. That's TC Energy and the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. We will be responsible for the viability of the financial model, not the ratepayers of Ontario. In return, through rate regulation, eligible costs that the Ontario, Ontario Energy Board deems a prudent league incurred would be reimbursed over a multi-decade long process with a sustainable rate of return provided already to Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and Bruce Power, among others. Both the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and TC Energy are asking to be treated in the same manner as these other system asset operators. The development of new energy projects can be challenging. Change can be hard. I am reminded of President Kennedy's moonshot speech from 1962 when he was describing why the United States would go to the moon. To paraphrase, we go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. We, right now, at this moment in time, with power outages happening in this very council meeting, have a collective responsibility to think about how we get to net zero how we achieve meaningful Indigenous reconciliation with our treaty partners, and how we secure a prosperous Canada for the next generation. Our proposed project represents an opportunity and a solution to actually address these growing demands, address the threats of climate change, address reconciliation, and address a made in Ontario and a made in Simcoe County energy security solution in every growing insecure world. I will conclude by saying there is a resolution of conditional support from the host municipality of Meaford. Your neighbors have provided an excellent process that outlines the steps this process, this project must take in order to maintain that support. I would encourage you to reach out to Meaford staff or council and ask questions and share in their learnings. I would also encourage you to read Powering Ontario's Growth, the Government of Ontario's Blueprint to Get to Net Zero. And again, I would encourage staff to reach out to Mayor Mark Barnett, your own Simcoe County staff, Clearview Township, that would have an important role in, tra in transmission, Wasega Beach, that would have an important role in transmission, Honda Canada, and Magna um, as examples of supply chain challenges. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to taking questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Shields. Would there be, is there any questions from the committee? M Member Burkett? Thank you. Through the chair to Mr. Shields, thank you for the presentation. How does the water get from Georgian Bay up to where you're pumping it? Um, yes, um, I'll ask uh, staff to put up like the slide that had that cutaway um, of like the um, of uh, of our project. So um, yeah, that's that's the one. Thank you very much. So uh, essentially, you'll see here a cutaway of our proposed um, concept. Um, so you'll see like uh, Georgian Bay. Um, this is the uh, yeah, that's it. So that is um, in like the uh, transportation hazard zone around the the military installation in Georgian Bay where you know, recreational boating and transportation is uh, restricted. Uh, so you'll see under the water um, a, a ring. Um, so that would be a buried uh, 
uh, dispersed inlet outlet system. So that ring represents an underground tunnel. Uh, the, that tunnel will be 800 meters uh, roughly offshore. Uh, and then sticking up from like that tunnel would be about 20 risers. Uh, these risers uh, would be, you know, fairly substantial. Uh, we're, you know, we're looking at multiple meters in height. Um, but the idea is it's similar to like a super soaker, uh, where if you disperse uh, the inlet outlet system um, and um, uh, it slows down the water to the point where um, our computer modeling has indicated that the rate of intake and the rate of outtake of water is about one kilometer an hour, which is the same general currents and flows of Georgian Bay. Well, supplementary um, to the chair. Sorry, Mr. Shields. I what I, I understand how that works, but is it electricity you're using? Is there a pump or is it gravity fed? How does that get the water from Georgian Bay up to where you are proposing that reservoir? I guess. Yeah. Uh, so the source of uh, of the power is uh, electricity, and more importantly, it is off-peak base load zero emissions electricity that Ontario has already paid for and built mostly in this part of the world through nuclear hydro and off-peak renewables such as wind the concept is when there is a low demand for electricity but Ontario is already generating electricity such as base load power we will consume that electricity and use pumps to pump water up like the, the escarpment towards that artificial reservoir and then when times of need are great for electricity, such as spikes in demand uh, for electricity, we would release that water again, back down through that same tunneling system, generate electricity and put that electricity back on like the energy grid. So All think right. of it as an insurance policy or a buffer for those spikes in demand for electricity going forward. Thank you for that supplementary, if I may, through the chair. So you're using and making money, which is great. We're in a in a, a society where we're allowed to do that, but you're using, based on the province, because there's low peak and high peak electrical rates, so you're taking advantage. So this isn't like solar, it's not like wind, this is uh, this is water, but you're, uh, well, good for you, but I have one other question, I, I won't, uh, when, the reservoir that you have up top, are you flooding a large area to create that large pond so that I, I presume the water that comes from that large pond off peak hours is gravity fed through a turbine and goes back into Georgian Bay or are you using pumps again? Uh, yeah, so uh, for like the uh, artificial reservoir at the at the at the top of the uh, of the hill, uh, that would be a, a man-made artificial reservoir. Uh, so that would be uh, uh, with an impermeable layer that would separate that lake water from any other kind of water source in like the area. And as to your point, it would be gravity fed. Um, so the idea with, is that you would open our valves, let the water back down into our, our, our pump house and power house where turbines then would be turned similar to a hydro dam, um, and then let that water back into Georgian Bay again at that one kilometer an hour rate. Uh, so that is like the, essentially what that, uh, what that concept um, uh, includes. And this concept has been around for over a hundred years and there are multiple nations that use this kind of concept. Right, man. Sorry, Mr. Shields. So the lands that you're flooding, like, do you have to do studies to see what what you're doing? Like the lands that are flooding, the, Im the animals that may be impacted. Like, how does that work? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so we uh, have been doing studies um, on the uh, Fourth Canadian Division Training Center now for uh, for for a few years um, in coordination with uh, with Indigenous monitors, uh, and so that footprint uh, does have to be studied. Uh, the uh, our, our our shoreline has to be studied. Our, our underground tunneling system has to be studied for impacts to the environment, um, impacts uh, to to water, uh, and also uh, transmission line options would also have to be studied. So we have been collecting that data. Uh, we'll be providing that data through a federal provincial impact assessment process, uh, and we look forward to sharing that information uh, through that process. Okay, thank you, Member Taylor. Uh, thank you to the chair. Uh, thanks for coming here today. I have a couple questions. The reservoir, can it be used for anything else? Like I know there's uh, lakes near Guelph that they, they allow sailboats on. Is that ever contemplated on this one? Um, unfortunately, no. Uh, this will continue to be a, an active military installation uh, where this uh, facility will be located. Uh, the Canadian Army, I don't think, is very keen with having neighbors uh, come onto like, the base. 
um, um, so this will be uh, mostly off limits uh, to uh, civilian uh, civilian use and recreational use. Uh, so that is the the single purpose of this artificial reservoir. Okay, and that supplemental uh, couple of slides down where it shows the, the the tunnels and that. So when you're generating power, the water comes out of the reservoir through the generators and then it loops around. So where are the return pumps located? Uh, so in 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 the underground powerhouse. Um, so if you go to the uh, cutaway uh, slide again, uh, we will have to develop a, an artificial cavern. Yeah, exactly where the mouse is uh, circulating. This uh, this cavern will be about uh, 50 meters um, in height. Uh, there are similar caverns built in Massachusetts and, and other facilities uh, in which that uh, that uh, that kind of technology has been used. Uh, it just so happens Canada has some pretty good miners. Uh, and so our mining technology will be coming into into place there, and it's that location where we'd have uh, those uh, that both that powerhouse and and pumping activity at that same location. And then a couple of slides down the inlet outlet ports. Can you describe what's going on there? I was go down two slides. It says top of ports position well below lake surface. So can you describe what that is? Yeah, so so this is like um, um, a point of view of what would what would be happening under the water, and um, and this is like a, a graphic that does that that does have to be um, updated to provide context. So, for example, like these inlet outlet ports, uh, the rough design of these looks very similar to our current uh, concepts, um, and we're continuing to refine like the the mesh and guardrails around like those ports. So, for example, we've been designing these ports in real time with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and a nuclear grade uh, fabricator, no one sound, uh, Makwakao, uh, in order to protect uh, fish and fish habitat. Um, so the size of these um, uh, components will be uh, roughly half like the water column. So where that boat is kind of located is at the top of like the of the water column. And so these, these risers then will be roughly like half of that, uh, of that water column, which will give it then another half uh, for, um, uh, uh, for clearance. So you'll see here that there, these uh, inlet outlet ports are capped at the bottom uh, and the top. So water can only uh, enter uh, from the side, which is similar to the water columns that are already in, in existence. They are off the ground. Uh, which means that uh, sediment and turbidity are being avoided uh, with uh, with ongoing kind of uh, kicking up of that uh, uh, of that turbidity. Um, they're spread out over about a kilometer and a half um, uh, with underground tunnels uh, to to take in that water and then also to release that water. Um, and with that dispersed technology, the flow of water, as I mentioned, will be roughly one kilometer an hour, uh, the same currents um, as um, as Georgian Bay. Okay, and just one last, uh, I question how well you can install it environmentally safe, and then what impact on the environment after it's in there too? Just my comments, thanks. Yeah, so, so to that point about construction, uh, we're actually looking at uh, what the city of Toronto has already done uh, with very similar technology. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a water uh, intake system called Ashbridge's Bay in the city of Toronto, where they have used uh, virtually the same kind of technology, where they have a long underground tunnel going into Lake Ontario. Uh, at the end of that tunnel, then they have risers that go up uh, into deep water, uh, into Georgian, um, into uh, Lake Ontario rather, and then they release uh, treated uh, water from like the city of Toronto back into like Lake Ontario. So we're using proven technology. Uh, a technology that has met or exceeded environmental standards and the construction technique specifically for the risers looking at what they did in Ashbridge's Bay is that they would have a platform and at that platform they would uh, sink um, a large uh, tube and in that tube they would pump the water out so that tube all, almost operates kind of like a caisson where you could then do work within that tube so water is not being impacted, uh, you know, sand and turbidity is not being interacted with like the rest of the rest of the wake water. Uh, you would then drill down uh, to like your existing tunneling system, uh, slip one of these uh, risers down that tube in order to attach it to our tunnel, remove the tube once uh, that activity is done in order to minimize impacts to like the, the lake bed and then continue that process. Um, uh, for like the rest of like the uh, risers. So at the end of the day, there would be nothing on the surface. Uh, there'd be nothing at the lake shore. There'd be nothing at the near shore. Uh, you would virtually see nothing uh, because everything is underground or underwater. Thank you. Member Cox. 
Yeah, <clears throat> through the chair. Um, so TC Energy, how long has it been around? Um, so we were enacted by Parliament in, I believe, 1952. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, we are a, a Canadian company based out of Calgary, Alberta. And uh, we provide like the backbone of moving natural gas from Western Canada to Eastern Canada, um, as well as uh, moving energy to the West Coast of um, of, uh, of, uh, of Canada, and also assets in, uh, in the United States and Mexico. Um, and also, are you like an independent company from the government? Yes, we are a publicly traded company. Uh, and we are uh, so we do raise uh, shares. We have a board of directors. Um, so um, I believe our top 20 owners or shareholders are very large Canadian institutional investors. So think of um, RBC, uh, the Health Nurses Union of Ontario, um, OMERS. Um, you know, think of large institutional Canadian investors and in pension plans. Those are usually the large shareholders of uh, TC Energy. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, the motion reads that the delegation by Herb Shields of TC Energy regarding the Ontario Pump Storage Project be received for information. Do I have a mover and seconder? Member Taylor, Member Minnings. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shields. We will now move on to our second delegation from Tim Buck, Amanda Greenfield, and Rupert kind Kindersley uh, from Save Georgian Bay uh, in regards to the TC Energy Project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you this morning. I'm Tom Buck. I've been studying this project for five years with our Save Georgian Bay team. And we have had partners like the Georgian Bay Association looking at the project as well. Uh, Rupert Kindersley is with us this morning. Um, and we also have uh, quite, a, quite a presence of residents that are in the Meaford area and beyond that study this project with us. We're a grassroots organization committed to stopping TCE Ener TC Energy's proposal for a pump storage plant on the Niagara Escarpment in the waters of Georgian Bay. Our hope is that Severin will consider supporting in principle the November resolution from the Township of the Archipelago objecting to the project. Um, I have spent time on Georgian Bay every year of my life, which began back in the 1950s. And my family has had a presence on Georgian Bay for almost 100 years. As we talk about this, I bring that pride and that uh, respect for this bay and these shorelands uh, into studying this project. Our efforts are to share information about this mag massive project happening across the bay in Meaford on the military base for CDTC. For CDTC is one of the most contaminated sites in Ontario. It is obvious that you care about the environment. Your stewardship and care very apparent this morning in the the way you talk about it and listen to people that are coming before you are a great model for all municipalities around the Bay. I admire the engagement you de demonstrated and the direction that you seem to be taking based on engagement. 10 minutes is uh, not much to talk about a project that may end up with a cost of over $10 billion and risks this precious Bay. Uh, uh, switch my slide here one moment. Uh, okay, so how did we get here? Energy demand is up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Mr. Shields covered that pretty well. There is a case for storage. The case for storage is... Uh, Tom, the slide presentation is not showing online. 
Oh, I am so sorry. Thank you, Lord Kindersley. Um, let's see if we can get that up. Okay, are we, is it there now? It is not. Oh. Would okay, you like the township staff uh, or Madam Clerk to put it up? How about now? Mr. Buck, it's there now. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Slide one was our uh, purpose. Slide two, how do we get there? Energy is growing. The case for storage is... Uh, it's pretty powerful. We need to capture excess energy when it's available and be able to deploy it into the grid when needed. We need options which make sense for ratepayers and for the environment. There are several options available. Mega batteries are available now. IESO is already contracted for eight of these battery uh, systems. Other solutions are becoming to market. There's a compressed air solution being tested in Kincardine. When we look at these in terms of impact on the environment, the compressed air flywheels and gravity solutions are the least impactful on the environment. Pumped hydro has the most adverse impact. They all provide carbon savings. And of course, those that are easier to construct and are more efficient do a better job at leveraging carbon reduction. You asked for a better description of pump storage. There are two versions, open loop and closed loop. Closed loop has two same size reservoirs, draws the water up and then sends it down each day. Up, down, up, down, same water. Open loop draws from a bay or a lake and then releases the water back into the bay. Both harm the environment, but the effects of an open loop are worse. TCE's proposal would involve excavating on the escarpment into the lake bed up to your water source and then in operation pulling water out of and then sending it back to your water source, Georgian Bay. Save Georgian Bay agrees create, in creating solutions, we need to find those which are most efficient, have the least impact on the environment and the least impact on ratepayer and taxpayer pocketbooks. TCE's proposal for Georgian Bay open loop, 375 acres at least for the reservoir, hundreds of acres of bay area for the intakes, a reservoir six stories high, massive tunnels excavated into the escarpment and amount of water pumped in and out. It's difficult to imagine and a 50 kilometer line running on the bottom of the bay from Meaford to Wasega Beach. So Mr. Shields talked about how the TCE new design is different than their former design and the Ludington design. But they originally came to the table with a design just like this one for Ludington and many people objected and said, there's no way that project would not even be approved today in the United States. In fact, the design they're proposing right now would have great difficulty being approved in the United States. If you take a look here, though, at the construction on the left-hand side, here we are on one of the most contaminated sites in Ontario. Look at the turbidity in the water. That is all uh, coming down from the project area from excavation of the uh, reservoir area. Uh, I want to add one other thing. And I apologize. The reason I look up here is I have a second screen. I'm looking at what I have on the screen at the moment. Um, Ludington's first few years, they were killing 150 million fish per year. Now these aren't all big rainbow trout. Some of these are fish eggs that are being killed according to the studies that were done. They mitigated with a part-time fence, but it's still over 100 million a year. TCE claims their intake design will be more effective. They haven't provided us though with any reports on the results of tests 
on the intake design. The fish kill and the other effects of Ludington were not known when they started operation in the 70s. Just as TCE does not know what the effects will be from anything they're doing on this project for four years. We need proof. We should insist on proof that it will not kill fish, that the contaminants won't go into the water, that other adverse effects will not occur. So ultimately, there's no economic benefit here. According to IESO, it does not provide ratepayer value. It doesn't add up. And the environmental risk to the escarpment in Georgian Bay are extreme. It's not worth the risk. So five years ago, it was a $2.3 billion project. Now it's up to 4.5. And they're saying they'll cap it at $7 billion. But we don't know what a cap means. Does that mean you're going to stop the project as soon as it gets to $7 billion or more? We don't know what that, that means. Ground hasn't been broken. It's an unsolicited proposal, and now they're asking for a 50-year contract, including reimbursement for their pre-development costs. <clears throat> IESO has moved forward with eight megawatt battery storage facilities on the grid. This alternative has the advantage of a shorter construction period, far more predictable, a 90% efficiency versus pump storage at 70% or less. This gives a strong adva economic advantage for ratepayers. The Oneida project, the first one of these to be constructed, is joint with the First Nations. So we've got a huge reservoir, 20 species at risk on the proposed site, significant contaminants from military operations, UXO, unexploded ordnance, fuel, benzene, PFAS. There will be fish kill, turbidity, sediment disturbance, and more. This is the largest archipelago, freshwater archipelago in the world. DCE says they will do no harm, but they have not shared how. I appreciated the, the comments earlier about the science. Let's see the science. Let's see the proof. How will you do no harm in this project when you're excavating the escarpment to the species at risk, to the contaminants to the bay? Um, I mean, they, they, they are describing the perfect project. So here's, uh, we asked the TCE show that laying and operating these cables across the bay will do no harm. There's a little diagram that shows the magnetic resonance that can occur with these. One of the contaminants on the base is PFAS from firefighting and fire training exercises. All the contaminants have the potential to get into the bay or air to get into our water systems and the fish, the fish that we catch and serve. TCE makes a number of claims. I want to highlight this particular one. They wrote a letter to all the municipalities around the Bay recently, and they said they cited the project to avoid contaminants. This is a diagram that came from our ATI FOI request with the Department of Defense. This was on one of the pages, and it shows these black circles that you see in the middle of the diagram. That's UXO. DND is saying we have UXO in that site. This is an overlay of where the reservoir is proposed to go. So something's mysterious there when uh, TCE is saying they cited it to avoid that. I am going to look at the species at risk. The uh, Mr. Buck, I'd like to remind you that you've got it uh, another minute or so. Okay. Same document from page from DND showed their awareness of 30 species at risk, 20 of those located on the on the site. Here's the other problem. Energy National Energy Board 17 of the 39 major pipeline accidents in Canada were on pipelines owned by TransCanada. So uh, I mentioned uh, Lord Kindersley, Georgian Bay Association, a quote from him is in your package. So as I close, let's just do the, let's just do the math together. 
So much is unforeseeable, a pristine environment with water that touches everyone. Four CDTC is one of the most contaminated sites in Ontario. TCE's poor environmental record, and they've never built a pump storage plant. That equals a risk to all of us. Let's protect the bay. Thank you very much. We do have a resident there. If you would be willing to hear from her, Mr. Chair, Amanda Greenfield, she can tell you about the residential perspective. Well, we had uh, a 10 minute presentation. I'm not sure, Madam Clerk, how long was that uh, presentation? It's pretty much used the full 10 minutes. Um, it's council's prerogative um, if to let um, her speak. Um, yeah. Okay, we'd let, please come up and speak. My name is Amanda Greenfield and it's RR number one Meaford. I'm here as a concerned resident from your neighboring rural community around the Bay, Meaford, Gray County. We share the love and admiration of our landscapes and especially our waters. We recognize your official plan, honoring the conserving and enhancing of the natural environment while agriculture is fundamental and a component. I'm asking, we're asking a community to stand and join in solidarity with the Township of Archipelago as we share in recognizing the environment as the primary imperative of its official plan, preserving Georgian Bay. We all must have a say in protecting our waters. It is difficult to fathom a project like TCE's when it has to do with the carving out of the Negra Escarpment. This is an UNESCO designated World Biosphere Reserve. I want to remind TCE that this is not Niagara Falls. There is an extensive alarm of changing the molecular structure of water with the underwater high voltage wires running from Meaford, passing by Thornberry, going over past Collingwood and coming out at Wasega Beach. Again, these are high voltage wires to travel that great distance. Yesterday, Mr. Mickelson from TCE was unable to secure even how that would be done. TCE's pump storage is a cost to all of us, the taxpayers. This isn't an issue of nimbyism, cottagers or wealth. This is about the possible impact of all of us in our backyards. I'm an educator. I embrace our Georgian Triangle. I embrace my neighboring Bay communities. We need to be vigilant, progressive. And if that's what TCE refers as nimbyism, I'm okay with that. I've worked on the National Defense Base for 14 years, held a position as an environmental health and safety representative. I am aware of the over 20 and more endangered species occupying at that proposed site. These are animal and vegetative species. They include our prestigious bald eagle and our butternut trees, all registered within the Species at Risk Act. Further to my knowledge of D&D Meaford site, I remind you that the 4th Canadian Division Training Centre began in 1942, when over 168 families were expropriated from their homes, their communities, which is called Cape Ridge, losing everything and having to start over. Since then, the base has been an active tank operation, infantry soldier qualification schools, holds special forces training, as well as a combat and tactical training facility for all of our Ontario police. The land on that base is over 19,000 acres. 
it has seen a lot of ammunition. Copper jacketing led predominantly core from bullets depleting uranium tanks, ordnance, and heavy metals. They have a tendency to leach into the environment, especially when land is disturbed. If any backhoe were to strike a UXO, a concussive blast leading to unstoppable detriments would occur. Now you add the noise, the visual pollutants, all in addition to an environmental massacre and a recipe for disaster. Again, TCE indicates that there will be minimal impact to D&D operations, not. They advertised that they had made this proposal not on private land, although for civilians, we have been unable to freely access D&D Meaford site for over eight decades. Why is that? Families of the original dwellings of Cape Rich are only permitted once a year pass to see their deceased on the cemetery site. D&D is willing to provide up to 700 acres and not make restitution to the original proprietors. Something's not up to scratch. The project threatens an enormous amount of fish and aquatic life yet TCE indicates that their massive sucking turbines that you saw in the slide, not just one of them, there was over 12 of them in that linear line, will kill fish only over the girth of five inches. Really? How do you think aquatic life are to survive? We learn about life cycles in elementary and primary school. That, in turn, would threaten our tourism, our cottaging, our boating, our entrepreneurship sectors that draw here, here and there, which is important to our economy. Picture this, the pulling up of 6 billion gallons of bay water up a 150 meter slope, which is the escarpment, every night, because again, the rate is the lowest, but just think, what if that rate changes? We have no guarantees. Then it releases into that holding reserve the size of 350 acres, just to then have the water from the reserve, which will change temperatures, be pushed back into our bay, causing irreparable damages to living organisms, altering biodiversities, and risking the methyl mercury being formed on that reservoir that you saw. Then spreading those contaminants back into our waters, the same water that many of us rely on to drink. The turbines being sucking up the minnows, the sediments, the small aquatic creatures, throwing off our entire aquatic system, minimal impact to our ecological footprint? I think not. Maintain cultural heritage of our lands? This implies to our Negra escarpment. This is the proposed site of TCE. This should mean that those views cannot be changed. Safety is what we need to think about. Safety is paramount. How can TCE Energy ensure the stability of the escarpment soil? What happens when there's a leak, an erosion, a washout? Our escarpment is made up of rich soils and rocks. Please keep in mind, it's not those that TCE likes to describe us as the NIMBYs, the waterfront residents. I'm rural Meaford. The first to be affected are the working farms, just at the lower lip, the 400 meters away from the proposed reservoir. These are heritage farms. Under the environmental laws, we must be aware of the changes of the flora and fauna of the water and adjacent waters too. Environmental devastation is certain if TCE's power storage plant plant were to continue. An area, I'm just, just finishing you know, up, minute, thank you. Second. An area of increasing concern is hypersensitivities, which are EMF waves. That will have a huge paramount distress on all of us, residents, animals, and species of water aquatic life. In closing, I ask Township of Severin to join your four neighboring mis municipalities in adopting and passing the Archipelago Resolution and stand in alliance 
with the continual preservation and protection of our natural attributes, these beauties are to be enjoyed and not compromised. Let's stop the monstrosity of TCE's pump storage and continue to be stewards of our lands and our waters like our indigenous brothers and sisters foster. We need to be mindful for our future generations. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Greenfield. Uh, do any of the members of the committee have any questions for the delegates? Member Burkett. Thank you, through the chair to Mr. Buck or Amanda. Now that uh, I think I, yeah, it is on uh, military land. Do they actually have to do any studies? Because it's federal land. I, like I question that. There is a three phase environmental study that must be done. That has not been completed. And TCE is talking like this project's already going ahead. So, that is not the case. So I question it only because I know that if you have an aerodrome, we as a as a municipality have no jurisdiction over aerodromes because they're federally regulated. So I can only assume the same thing would happen with this piece of property. But I could be wrong. We, we have seen this uh, happen with Ontario Place, right? And it appeared to be happening with the green belt down around the city. Um, the big city. So we don't know. Uh, there are exemptions. They're going to have several exemptions because it is federal property. Mr. Kindersley, I see that you've got your hand raised. Yes, um, my questions are for uh, TC Energy and I raised them at uh, the last, uh, and I'd like an answer from them this time if possible, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, completed. Sorry, uh, uh, anyway. delegation has been has been concluded. Yes, I realize that. Um, but uh, okay, well then I'll, I'll rephrase it. Um, one of the uh, key supports for TC's claim that this is a climate change friendly uh, project is their study that they did that shows that it will have a an imp it will reduce CO two emissions. Um, and this was a study that uh, was done in 2019. I met with them in 2020. I uh, challenged them that their study was incomplete um, because it did not account at all for the lost exports of uh, power that they will be using to pump uh, this water uphill. And, and, don't, and, and please remember, they are basically use, using 50% more power than they're providing back into the grid. Um, all Mr. batteries, all storage projects lose energy. They do not create it. Um, and uh, uh, they refuse to expand their study to uh, to um, uh, to make it complete. Um, and they're still using it to show that they're climate change friendly. Um, it, it's very unlikely that that is the case. And in fact, that there's sorry. Yes. Um I do have to remind that the three individuals presenting were given an original allotment of 10 minutes together to make your deputy. Right. Um, council has already um, very nicely uh, granted sure. extra time. So uh, this section of the meeting is purely for council to ask questions. Um, right. If you had wished to make statements, um, I, I unfortunately it was part of your allotted 10 minute period. Um, and so we do we do have to put a cap on comments made uh, from the delegates so that council uh, can ask their questions and so we can move on to the rest of our agenda as well. So, oh, okay. Uh, is there any further questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, uh, could we have a motion, Madam Clerk? Thank you. Uh, so the motion at this point, unless council changes it reads, that the delegation by Tom Buck, Amanda Greenfield, Rupert Kindersley um, from Save George and Bay regarding the TCE Energy Project be received for information. Member Taylor? Yeah, just a question to the clerk. Uh, did we receive the um, the letter from George and Bay re requesting support? Is that in our file? I honestly cannot remember at this point in time. I don't think so. Council would have been circulated. I do so provide all those motions to council as they come in. Because I suggest if, if it did, then we uh, council should react to that. Yeah, I believe there was two uh, motions that were referred to today. One was the motion from Meaford Council, and then the other one was the motion from the town of uh, um, Township of the Archipelago. 
uh, <laughs> as that uh, four municipalities have supported. Yeah, so just for clarification, per your procedure bylaw, you have essentially two options on this one because budget is not a piece, um, would be to receive information and refer it for a staff report. Member Cox. If we received it for information and the motions were brought forward to go to a consent agenda, could we pull in and discuss it? Okay, let's do something like that then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're moving on to item E in our agenda, consent agenda. Would any members of the committee like to to uh, pull a consent agenda item? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to point F, uh, approval of the regular agenda. Uh, the motion. The motion reads that the agenda be adopted, including consent items as circulated. Could I get a mover and seconder? Member Brennan, Member Minnings, all in favor? Carried. Okay, I see that we have no reports from officials. Um, is there any new business? Seeing no new business, we do not have a closed session today. <laughs> I'd like to move for adjournment. Yes, at 12 into special counsel. <laughs> so just, okay, so motion passed. You have to call yeah, the oh, sorry. I'd like to make the motion to adjourn. Uh, mover and seconder, member Burkett, member Cox, all in favor? Carry. Perfect. Yeah. We can shift chairs quick, then we can keep, keep trucking. You're fine there? How long will you I don't think we'll be more than 10 minutes, 10 minutes? Okay. unless council's got a lot to talk about. But. Oh, Mayor Mike, you need your microphone. Call the meeting to order. We'll begin with our land acknowledgement at the Township of Severn. We recognize the following land acknowledgement. We'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and which the Township of Severn operates as a part of the traditional territory of the Ashinaabe. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples have been inhabiting and caring for this land. In particular, we acknowledge the territory of the Ojibwe or Chippewas peoples. This territory is covered by Lake Simcoe Treaty 16 and the Jade Collins Land Purchase. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first and Inhabitants. Now single Canada, right? Oh, can we skip? Okay, I don't have the recording ready for today. <laughs> we can skip. <laughs> Sounds lovely. Oh, your microphone. Oh, sorry. Consent agenda. J1 uh, reports from officials, planning development, oh, planning. We, we do need to adopt the agenda, oh, sir. Adopt. Madam Clerk, I need a mover and a seconder, please, to adopt the agenda. Moved by Deputy Mayor Cox, second by Councillor Taylor. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, J1.1, planning report number P24-008, part lot control exemption bylaw, Greenwood Landing Development, blocks 84, 85, and, block, and part block 86, plan 51M-12227, sorry. 89, 79, 99 to 105 Brandon Avenue, Miss Woodrow, or is it? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this report to council is about a part lot control exemption by law application submitted by the developers of Greenwood. The plan of subdivision has received final approval and construction is underway of the freehold townhouse units. The part lot control exemption application seeks to facilitate the conveyance of individual freehold townhouse units. The proposed lot creation is consistent with the plan of subdivision approval and is in compliance with the requirements of the township zoning bylaw with respect to lot coverage, lot frontage, and minimum lot areas. 
Uh, Section 50 of the Planning Act does grant the township and the county the authority to pass a bylaw to exempt lands within a plan of subdivision from part lot control provisions in the Planning Act. Um, essentially, this is an alternative form of lot creation um, in other than a plan of subdivision or a consent application. There are no notice requirements for this application because the notice was given as part of the subdivision approval. Um, and the number of lots proposed to be created through this application is consistent with that approval. Should council pass the bylaws, they would be provided to the County of Simcoe for registration. And once the bylaw was registered on title, then the developer could convey the individual lots um, as described on the reference plans. The developer's lawyer has provided an undertaking to ensure that the easements are registered on the properties to provide for those rear yard access to the internal units. Um, and as council would be familiar, the recent update to the fencing bylaw um, is now in effect, so the there would be no impediments to access those rear yard easements through uh, further development. Uh, I did just want to point out to Council that there has been a couple of small clarifications made to the bylaws as included on the agenda. The bylaws have been slightly revised to just note which parts on the reference plan would be subject to the easement, um, and that's just a very small technical clarification that's been done to those bylaws. Uh, so if Council has any questions, more than happy to uh, to discuss with you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brad. Councillor Taylor. Yes, through the, through the mayor to Brad. So on page four of nine, where it shows the blocks 84, 85, 86, what is what is block 86, the little yellow strip there? Is that, what is that? Through the mayor to Councillor Taylor. Um, so block 86, uh, only a very small portion of that block has been included in this application because the developer has proposed to um, with their easements, they're proposing an easement that straddles the property line between block 85 and 86. So the easement is 1.5 meters wide down that side yard. So what the developer has proposed to do is have a 0 0.75 meter wide easement on block 86 and the other half of the 0 0.75 meters on block 85. So essentially they would achieve the full 1.5 meter width. It's just straddled between two different blocks. Thank you. Any other comments, Council? No, thank you. Councillor Mennings. Sorry, thank you. Through the chair to um, uh, to the planner. Are the other lots shown that um, surrounding this block? Will they also be developed? Have they been developed? I'm just I'm just wondering how these are the ones that are considered. First, if you can just give me a better scope of the area. Thank you. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Mennings. So as uh, included on that map, you will see some of those larger blocks and those are intended to be developed with townhouse units in the future. Um, the reason why you're seeing these two applications now without the others is that part law control applications are typically made at the stage once construction has started on the townhouse um, units so that the developer can accurately lay out the proposed property lines to ensure that they do go down the center line between the units and they don't run into issues with you know any sort of alignment in the future so they wait for construction to start then they would make the application so as those other blocks are developed in the future an application such as this would return to council for each block thank you and just subsequent so it, with other townhouse blocks that are part of future subdivision plans that we've seen would this be a similar process or is this an exemption to the the normal process through the mayor to councillor minnings um, any block on a plan of subdivision that's going to be developed with townhouse units and are in, and are intended to be freehold units meaning that um, you know they're not part of a condo or, or rentals but owned uh, privately they would go through a similar process such as this any further comments? Madam Clerk, do you have a motion? Certainly. So the motion reads that planning report number P24-008 dated March 6, 2024, with respect to a part lot control bylaw applications for the lands described as block 8485 and part lot 86 on plan 51M1227 be received 
that the draft part lock control exemption bylaws included as attachment five and six to the planning report as amended be brought forward immediately. Mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Jansen, second by Councillor um, Brennan. Thank you. All in favor? That's carried. Moving on, planning report uh, P24-013, deeming bylaw application 3386 Escona Avenue, West Shore. Who would like to speak to that? Emily, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burkett. Um, so an application for deeming bylaw is before you, I guess, this afternoon now regarding um, the property recognized as 3386 as Kona Avenue. It is located within the West Shore settlement area. The owners have applied for a deeming bylaw to deem the lots that form the property being lot 140 and the south part of lot 139 on plan 811 um, to no longer be parts on um, that plan of subdivision to allow them to merge. As committee is aware, um, when a property is composed of two separately conveyable lots on a plan of subdivision, the zoning provisions apply to each of those lots individually. Um, the township solicitor has confirmed that they are separately conveyable, um, so the applicants have applied to have them deemed to allow them to merge and to allow them to develop the property as a single parcel and benefit from the full development potential of the lot. Um, happy to answer any questions, but that's sort of the summary of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Any questions, uh, Council? None. Madam Clerk, do you have a motion? Thank you. A uh, motion reads that planning report number P24-013 dated March 20th, 2024, with respect to a deeming bylaw application for the lands described as lot 140 and south part lot 139, plan 811, known municipally as 3386 Escona Avenue, be received, and that the draft deeming bylaw included as attachment 3 to planning report P24-013 be brought forward immediately. And further, that should council pass the deeming bylaw, the clerk be directed to provide a certified copy of the bylaw to the clerk of the county Simcoe per section 5026 of the Planning Act. We move in a seconder, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor Cox, seconded by Councillor Jansen. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. I move uh, in camera. Closed session, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Motion reads that committee resolve in a closed session okay. and that the meeting is hereby now closed to the public pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, Chapter 25, Section 2392 you, for the purpose of considering a personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees. Thank you. Moving a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Taylor, second by Deputy Mayor Cox. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Oh, shoot. Give me one second here. We close the meeting that's got the live stream.
No, but he can still sit here. You just can't. You know. Yeah, Phil can. You might want to sit up there until we take the actual vote. Oh, sure. But yeah, it's an open session. So yeah. here. No You're good to come back. Okay, so we're back into open session. Um, so the motion reads that closed session adjourn at 1.16 p.m. and that the meeting is hereby now reopened to the public. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And Councilor Taylor, all in favor? <laughs> Okay, next motion reads that administration report number 824-11 dated March 20th, 2024 regarding the Kuchi Ching OPP detachment board be received and that the following appointee be appointed as the township of Severance representatives to the Kuchi Ching OPP detachment board for a term commencing April 1st, 2024 and expiring on November 14th, 2026. Uh, Mayor Burkett, elected representative and Drew Brennan as the community representative. Oh, Mayor, you don't have your microphone. Moved by Councillor Jansen, second by Councillor Minnings. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. General bylaws. Madam Clerk. Motion reads that bylaws number 2024 through 16 through 2024 18 are hereby read a first, second, third time and finally passed. Seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Minnings, second by Councillor Taylor. All in favor? That's carried. Announcements? Any announcements? No. Just, oh, just, just uh, remind, Madam CAO. Just to remind Council. Sorry. Right. The yes, bigger pictures, it starts after council. Oh, wow. okay. okay, confirmation bylaw, Madam uh, Clerk. Thank you. Motion reads that bylaw number 2014-19 being is hereby ready for second, third time, and finally passed. Mover and seconder, please. Move by Councillor Brennan, second by Councillor Jansen. All in favor? That's carried. German, Madam Clerk. Meeting is hereby adjourned at 1.17 p.m. Thank you. Mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor Cox, second by Councillor Jansen. All in favor? It's carried.